morning, Stephanie. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Tired, but good. But we're just going to do a live sound check, so give us just one second, okay? Sure. Sound check one presenter. Sound check one presenter. Be back in pre meeting, Liz.
Okay, councillors, we are now live. And my computer froze, of course. There we go. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the City's website as well. A reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Members of the committee are reminded of the five minute time limit which will be adhered to during this meeting. Members can submit another request to speak if they require more time to ask questions or to make comments. I'm now going to conduct the roll call. Give me one second here to flip the page. What's going on with my mouse today? Okay, Mayor Eisenberger. Present. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Councilor Wilson. Thanks. Good morning. Councilor Farr. Councilor Nan. Good morning, present. Good morning. Councilor Marula. Present, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Good morning, sir. Councillor Collins. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Councillor Jackson. No, not yet. Councillor Paul. Q, I'm here. Good morning. <laughs> Councillor Danko. Councillor Pearson. Good morning, present, sir. Good morning, Councillor Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Ferguson. Hi, I'm here. Good morning, Councillor. Councillor Vanderbeek. Good morning. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Councillor Whitehead. <coughs> and Councillor Partridge. Thank you. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda for today's meeting? Yes, sir, Mr. Deputy Mayor, there's two changes to today's agenda. The minutes of January 26th and item 9.1, Neighbor to Neighbor Community Food Center Funding is a notice of motion. Thank you. May I have a mover and a seconder to approve the changes to the agenda? Moved by Councillor Paul, seconded by Councillor Wilson. Is there any comments or questions about the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to the vote. Close and the vote carried 12 nothing. Thank you. Uh, we are, are now moving on to declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest this morning? Seeing none, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. This is item 3.1 on your agenda. May I please have a move and a seconder to approve the minutes of January 26, 2021, as presented? Moved by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move to the vote, please, Madam Clerk. Answers. Councilor, ja Councilor Jackson is giving me a thumbs up. The vote is now closed. We carried 13 nothing. Thank you. Moving on to presentations, item 6.1, Public Works Department 2021 Operating Budget. Dan McKinnon, the General Manager of Public Works, will provide the presentation for item 6.1. Just a reminder to the councillors that we are receiving these presentations. We're not approving the Public Works budget today. We're just receiving the presentation. Thank you. Mr. McKinnon, you're way ahead of me. You got the big screen all ready to go. Good morning, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and thank you for the uh, <clears throat> excuse me for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be presenting for you the uh, 2021 Public Works uh, budget overview and budget request. And uh, I think I'm going to follow Mike Garrick's lead from yesterday, and ask that all the uh, directors in, in Public Works turn on their cameras. Uh, it's the one time year where I get the opportunity to uh, to introduce them to the community. I'm I'm. Uh, I, I'm aware that Councillor is very familiar with the directors, but uh, I would like to just introduce them and, and take a minute to do that. So, Director of uh, HSR, Debbie Dalvadov. Take the screen Director down. Of Hamilton Water. Uh, sorry, uh, Director Mr. of 
Yeah, take Mr. your McKinnon. Take your screen. I down. suggest that you take your screen down yeah. and then you introduce everyone and then we can see them and then we can put your screen back up. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Sorry okay. For the um, so, yeah, no, very good. Uh, Director of uh, HSR, Debbie Dalvadov. Want to give us a wave? Director of Hamilton Water, Andrew Grice. Uh, Director of Energy Fleet and Facilities, Rome D'Angelo. Uh, Director of Engineering Services, Gord McGuire. Director of Environmental Services, Craig Murdoch. And Director of Transportation, Edward Soldo. So, uh, this is the uh, uh, the brain trust, if you will, that moves public works forward. And uh, if there was, uh, you know, they they certainly passed the test of the idea. If you've uh, if you wanted to be in a um, uh, a foxhole, these are the group of people that you'd want to be in there with. So I'm uh, very, very pleased to introduce them this morning. Uh, I'm assuming that my presentation is back on the screen now. I hope. Yes, it is. Uh, beyond the uh, the senior leadership team at Public Works, I also do want to recognize some other folks directly in my office. So Pat Leishman is my uh, manager of uh, quality assurance and strategy. And within her shop, she has Andrea Vargas, Arlen Leeming, Lou D'Souza, Ann Thomas, and Toyin Ogunwali. And I just want to uh, to recognize them because they are the, uh, the group that helps to uh, keep me organized every day and to move forward the, uh, the strategic uh, initiatives in Public Works. And beyond that, um, the corporate services and the CMO office, I have supports uh, with my finance manager in Mike Segaric's shop, Ashley Bono and her sidekick, Katie Black, as well as Kelly Cavanaugh is my business partner. And these folks are all essential in making sure that uh, kind of the strategic leadership of Public Works is happening in, a, in an adequate way. And I wanna give a, a special thanks to, uh, to team Jasmine this year. Jasmine McDonald is uh, completing uh, an 18 month secondment into my office and did all the heavy lifting on this budget presentation today. And she worked with Jasmine Graham to help uh, make it look good. And uh, so just wanted to make sure that I recognize their efforts. Uh, I'll just be driving the presentation today, but it really is the fruits of their efforts. And last but not least, I, I want to uh, recognize Nancy Wunderlich. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Mike talked about Diana yesterday and how important she is to his success. And I, I, I'll repeat the same thing. Uh, Nancy Wanderlich is is uh, absolutely essential to uh, uh, to me being successful in my role, and uh, not only has she had a tremendous amount of patience uh, with me over the years, she's become a very good friend. So, I appreciate that the length of the presentation today is quite long. Uh, as always, I will do my best to move through it uh, efficiently, and we're going to cover ground that I know is familiar to Council. Uh, but I wanted to make sure the content was there for uh, for a reminder, as well as for those folks who may be watching online, uh, as they may be less familiar with some of the content. So um, I do have a friendly wager with, with Jason Thorne that I'll get through the presentation before he finishes the first chapter of whatever book it is that he's reading today. So, so uh, <laughs> now that's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Public Works overview, Public Works really does provide the services that are fundamental and central to the lives of Hamiltonians and really uh, provide the, the foundation for the quality of life that we enjoy in the city of Hamilton. And so um, having said that, this the city does provide uh, over 70 services to the community and Public Works is directly responsible for about 16 of them and 60 of the sub services that the city of uh, residents in the city of Hamilton enjoy and interact with on a regular basis. Just a bit of uh, history here where we've been over the last few months. So council did receive the water rate uh, uh, budget presentation from Andrew on November the 23rd. You approved the uh, capital budget on November the 27th. Uh, Transit day was presented to council just last week. And I, I wanna congratulate both uh, Debbie and Andrew. I thought both of their presentations were exceptional. And, uh, and today I'm really gonna focus on uh, the remaining four divisions in public works as you've, you've already heard from, from Deb and, and Andrew. And so the, uh, the remaining uh, divisions are where you'll see the focus and the emphasis of this, uh, this presentation today. So I was uh, reflecting on this photograph, uh, uh, considering the weather that we had yesterday, I was hoping to find a way to put uh, Bernie Sanders in the, over on the sidewalk there with his mittens, but I wasn't able to do it this morning, so. <laughs> so keeping in mind the uh, strategic plan for the city of Hamilton and our strategic priorities, uh, it's not always obvious where Hamilton or where Public Works might see the reflection in the strategic priorities, but over the last few years, we've set our minds to making sure that we think about that 
And I think the uh, following presentation will illustrate that we do see ourselves in all of the strategic priorities in public works. And as well, we, uh, we've we worked hard to uh, to make sure that the council's term of council priorities are reflected in not just the work that we do every day, but in this presentation here today. So as I uh, drive through the presentation today, you will see this logo on a number of slides and it's there just to remind council that uh, some of the content on those slides relates to the term of council priorities. So if I don't have the presence of mind to point that out at the time, you'll be reminded by the, uh, the presence of that logo. I had a very good friend of mine ask me the other day, um, he said, what are you doing with all your staff during the lockdown? And it, it, it was a question that kind of surprised me, but I think it was a very good question. And I thought the answer might be worth sharing with committee today. And, and while I, I expect that uh, it won't be any surprise to committee, it may be useful for uh, those listening in the community to hear the answer to that question. And so uh, the, the essence of what we do in public works is we operate, we maintain, we undertake capital renewal. And in every sense of the word, we are first responders when it comes to infrastructure failure or regular weather like we got yesterday or when we have severe weather, uh, whether it's wind storms and our forestry department is out or, or whether it is uh, flooding. Uh, public works is, is we are frontline essential workers and except for a couple of weeks very early in the spring when the province was trying to sort out how we were gonna deal with the, uh, the pandemic, public works has been on the job around the clock. And uh, it, you know the evidence of that is the traffic lights that operate every day, the uh, the buses that uh, folks may pass while they're traveling through the city, the fact that their garbage is being collected and the grass is being cut, and when they go to the tap in their kitchen, uh, the water is flowing. So, so the short answer to my friend is we're doing what, everything that we always do, and and a heck of a lot more. And 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 particularly this year, we were doing it shorthanded because we didn't have access to the students the large number of students that we normally do. So in just in, in follow up to that, the next few slides are gonna articulate a, a, just a, a snapshot of some of the things that we had to do as a result of the pandemic. And I do wanna focus on this photograph just for a minute because uh, Kevin May Lou and Sam Esposto who are in the picture here, uh, I, I know that they were smiling because of the fact that their picture was being taken, but it really does represent the attitude that I think Public Works met the challenges of this year with the optimism, uh, the get it done attitude, the imagination and the resourcefulness that our staff showed throughout this year has been uh, really exceptional and it's make, it, it makes me exceptionally proud to be the representative both here at council and in the community. The photo also illustrates some of the teamwork that happened this year when it became evident that we needed to set up uh, assessment centers for uh, testing. Uh, Rome D'Angelo and his team were uh, heavily involved in, in assisting in that and I wanna give a big shout out to Sam Chiardulo because he was the fellow who came up with the idea of using Gander Check Arena. Rather than trying to procure tents and deal with the weather that was inevitably gonna happen during the testing period, Sam came up with the idea of just using the inside of the rink. And so a teamwork approach with Rome D'Angelo's shop to set up the inside of the rink, Edward Soldo's team to develop the traffic management plan, and then the health folks to work inside, I think is a great example of the type of teamwork that's happened on a number of occasions throughout the pandemic. And quite frankly, I think just happens through the normal course of business across the city. By way of some examples of the extra work that hit our work plan this year as a result of the pandemic, uh, I, I don't think there's a division that was more affected by this than Rome D'Angelo and his team, all the deep cleaning that they've had to do, the mothballing of facilities, the reopening of facilities, the uh, the posting of signs about what was happening at the different facilities so the community would know what was going on. The photograph in the middle is the shot of the Yander Chuck Arena and all the, uh, the great work that was done in there. Rome as well was also responsible uh, for helping to support the uh, setup of the first Ontario Centre with the agencies that ran that as a shelter. And then probably one of the uh, one of the greatest stories that happened behind the scenes was in a matter of days in the spring, Rome and his team stood up a complete warehouse to not only um, warehouse PPE for our long-term care facilities and our paramedic services, we were also warehousing PPE for Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joseph's Healthcare. This was done in a matter of days and is a real tribute to the, uh, to the great work that Rome and his team always do um, and, and providing an essential service at a very critical moment in time when PPE was on the minds of everybody who was thinking about the pandemic. In addition to that, 
Um, I think Craig Murdoch shared with me that we probably purchased enough caution tape to spread across the entire Trans Canada Highway when we were um, marked. We had to do in facilities the responding to the changing orders and requirements and guidance that was coming out of the province. Uh, we had a number of conversations at the EO and then had to replace on a number of occasions to follow the guidance that we were given from the province. And I know that Debbie talked last week about the Aegis coating that was put on the buses and that is an antimicrobial coating uh, to make sure that we were keeping the buses as clean as we could and protecting the riders on the buses. Some of the things that we had to do to pivot was moving to a virtual environment. And uh, so a couple examples there where we started to use tablets. We had already started down the road of using tablets in, the, in, the, uh, in our work processes, but it became even more important for us to engage that type of technology so that we could continue to do um, a lot of our work from remote locations. And also engaging uh, virtually when we, uh, we did our community engagement and our public consultations throughout the year. The photograph in the type, top right hand corner is a picture of a couple of our waste collectors and you know they were uh, they showed a lot of courage and, and, and the resilience as we went through the early days and, and the photograph actually shows those two collectors with with their face masks on but in the early days of the pandemic you will recall that we were not wearing face masks there was a belief early on that they weren't necessary as long as we observed social distancing and the decision to go to make uh, face masking was uh, long after the pandemic kind of uh, hit us and so uh, a great uh, a shout out to the waste collection team for their uh, for their resilience going forward. Uh, the bottom right hand corner is just an example of how we had it as, had to change our operations. That's a tailgate meeting that happens on a regular basis. So, just observing the social distancing and the fa uh, the mask wearing, as well. I know that Debbie uh, talked about the bio shields that were made to uh, be installed on all of our buses in our fleet, and and I know she did this last week, but I want to do it again. I really want to give out a shout out to. Uh, the local company, Archmill Industries in Ancaster. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know what we would have done without them because uh, we were trying, and Debbie's team was trying very hard to source the, the acrylic and the materials to make the bio shields. And uh, lo and behold, we had an expert right here in our own backyard who uh, saved the day with us as far as getting those installed. The last thing that I'll refer to on this slide is the, uh, the quality management logo that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. And while quality management is something we talk a lot about and may not, um, be familiar to those uh, listening in. It really uh, supported us well as we went through the pandemic because one of the primary uh, elements that we implemented through the quality management system was the Intellect's document management system. And throughout the pandemic, through the EOC, over 30 different work instructions and procedures were approved and modified on a number of occasions. And the ability for frontline staff to have access to those the most current and approved uh, guidance document about how they were to do their work was crucial for us to be successful in the early days of the pandemic. And so just another example of how the quality management system is beginning to serve us very well throughout Public Works and the, and, and the rest of the organization. So I'm gonna move, move on to the, the themes of the corporate strategic priorities now. And uh, uh, whenever I'm doing a presentation about Public Works, I always like to find an opportunity to use a picture of the tropical greenhouse because it really is a beautiful facility. Came online uh, about a year and a half ago and it's just a great illustration of the types of investments that uh, Council has made and the great work of our horticulture team. It really is, I would say, a jewel in the in the uh, the crown of our parks and, and recreational amenities across the city. So if I focus here just for a few minutes on clean and green as a strategic priority, um, some of the, the, uh, the green uh, things that have happened throughout 2020, uh, we uh, undertook the, the balance of the LED uh, light uh, replacement throughout the, the street lighting uh, inventory. And we're now enjoying 35% reduction in energy costs across uh, the portfolio. Since 2014, we've seen approximately about a $1.8 million annual budget reduction in our energy costs as a result of that project. And so uh, huge compliments to uh, the people who delivered that project. It started in Gordon McGuire's shop with Mike Field and. And, um, and his team and uh, Dupankar Sharma and, and the gang, they really did an excellent job on that. The other thing that uh, I'll identify in this slide as well, we have just completed uh, the eighth of 10 years of our uh, Emerald Ash Borer program, which was something that I don't think any of us would have asked for, but Craig Murdoch and his team have done a great job in implementing the, uh, 
that program to make sure that folks in the community are safe and not put at risk by uh, uh, by uh, dying and, and falling trees, as well as the replacement program that is seeing uh, a one-for-one -one replacement in the uh, in the inventory of uh, trees across the community. I'm not going to speak to every uh, piece of information on the slide here, but I do just want to talk about the fact that the uh, the electric vehicles that we've purchased, Rome has been looking for opportunities to uh, purchase different types of vehicles when it comes to propulsion. And when you're looking at passenger vehicles, it's fairly easy to do because uh, we can build the generate or the uh, the charging stations fairly uh, fairly reasonably. But as we start to look at our bigger fleet, uh, it is going to take a more comprehensive approach to that. So Rome will be coming forward about mid-year this year with a comprehensive green, green fleet strategy so that Council can have a look at the options that are available for us to really start to impact our GHG emissions when it comes to our rolling stock and to uh, to serve the, uh, the declaration of a climate emergency that Council made uh, recently. And then the last thing I'll just speak to on this slide is the uh, the number of bike lanes that have been uh, uh, installed throughout 2020, notwithstanding the fact that we were in a pandemic, there was a lot of great work done with respect to mobility. I know that Jason spoke to this yesterday. I will be speaking about it again in future slides, uh, but uh, some really great work done uh, in a partnership between planning and ECDEV and public works. So probably the flagship program from a clean perspective in any community would be their waste management program. And so um, this has been an absolute monster of a portfolio to manage over the last couple of years. It's a very challenging portfolio in the best of times, but considering of where we've been over the last couple of years with the compost facility, with the, um, you know, the contract disputes with we've, that we've had with a couple of our vendors, um, with the, the large number of contracts that were the operating contracts that were coming due, uh, I really do have to acknowledge the extraordinary work that Craig Murdoch, Joel McCormick, and Kathleen McCoslin have done. Uh, important to mention as well that both Joel McCormick and Catherine are the, the managers who basically run the entire portfolio with support from Angela's story. But Joel and Angela, or excuse me, Joel and Catherine have both been in their positions for less than two years. I think Council was very familiar with Emil Perpich and uh, Colin Vidler. Both of them uh, uh, moved on to other opportunities. And so, in, in, in an extraordinary period of time when there's been no end to the challenges with waste portfolio, that team has really done an extraordinary job. If I focus on some of the numbers on the slide, our diversion rate is currently at 39.8%. And uh, as council will remember, the, the original uh, solid waste master plan had identified a diversion rate of 65% as the, the stretch goal, if you will, that we were looking to achieve by 2008. Unfortunately, we haven't reached that, and there's been a number of factors as to, to why we're not there. The reality is the uh, waste management portfolio is changing. We do know that the Blue Box program is going to get uploaded to the province to, and produce a responsibility. Uh, as a reminder for Council, we have asked the province to make our date the first year that the transition is going to happen in 2023. We do believe that Hamilton has been earmarked to move in 2025. Uh, Craig and his team are going to look for opportunities to vocalize our objections to that with the province because that will result in an annual uh, budget um, uh, of about $14 million, a net budget uh, requirement of about $14 million for every year that we have to go beyond 2023. So it's an important issue that we are going to be uh, keeping our eye on. And so when we consider the diversion rate of 39% and think about the opportunities that we're gonna to have to make real progress on that in the short term, with all the changes that are gonna happen, uh, it doesn't feel like we're gonna have a tremendous opportunity to move the needle on that. But I know that Craig and his team with, through Angela Shop are gonna be working hard uh, from an outreach perspective to continue and to amp up the uh, communications to the community uh, to try to encourage them as much as possible to, uh, to um, to change their habits and, and how they use uh, how they use the system and try to, to, to increase our diversion rate. Again, sticking with clean and green, uh, there's just an image of some of the new equipment that we got down uh, for the downtown cleanliness um, program. It's a fully electric self-propelled uh, vacuum machine that our staff use. Uh, in addition to that, we, we've been doing a lighting upgrade at the uh, materials recy recycling facility. Uh, to cut down on our costs there as well. That's going to have a positive impact on our budget. And just some examples of some of the other construction work that Rome is doing, uh, not only on behalf of Hamilton Housing and the library board, 
but with our rec facilities to uh, to build lead style facilities that will be very uh, kind to the environment and, and very, very energy efficient. Uh, the bottom right hand photograph is a picture of our biosolids management facility. And I know Andrew talked about that in his presentation, so I won't spend too much time on that, but that really is bringing Hamilton uh, into uh, into the modern age with how we handle our biosolids. So just a, a check in on what COVID meant to the clean and green portfolio this year. Uh, I, I guess the, the key message to take, take away from this slide is that every part of uh, public works was touched by the pandemic. And one of the things that uh, became very evident in the early days was we just couldn't make enough signs for all the requirements that we had around the community to try to guide users of our facilities to keep them safe. Uh, it did get to a point where at one point, uh, Jasmine Graham had to lay down the law that nobody could make their own signs anymore. We had to have some control over how the signs were made, what the key messages were that were on them. And it did take a fair bit of effort to uh, to just make sure that we were, uh, that we were putting up the right signs. As further evidence that I was listening to Jason Thorne's presentation yesterday, uh, the collaboration between uh, planning and public works with respect to the uh, the mobility recovery plan uh, not only did we add additional kilometers of bike lanes in Hamilton throughout 2020, uh, what we do know about cycling is that um, if people feel safe, they're, they're more apt to use the cycling facility. So what we did was make uh, some of our existing cycling infrastructure more robust and safer for uh, those users of those facilities in order to help with the recovery. And so the photograph in the bottom right, just or both photographs actually illustrate some of the tactics that we've used uh, to increase the protection for folks using the cycle lanes uh, to protect them from traffic and to, to hopefully increase the amount of uh, usage that we see in those, uh, those facilities. One of the projects that um, I, I don't think I uh, anticipated as being one of the showstoppers for the entire year was the Keddie Trail. And I would encourage every member of council and anybody in the community who has not uh, seen it yet to, uh, to, take a, to take a visit of it. It is a cycle track that is, uh, ascends the mountain along the Claremont Access, and it was built this year through Gordon McGuire's shop. Again, a great collaboration between Brian, Hall Brian Hollingworth and planning, Edward Soldo and transportation and Gordon McGuire's shop to bring this online. In addition to some uh, road resurfacing that we did on the uh, the vehicle portion of the, uh, of the Claremont, this facility is, is no question going to become a, a destination for uh, not only people in the community, just to check it out because the views of the city as you walk up and down this uh, facility are extraordinary and the connections to the trails uh, just the thought and and the, uh, the the design that was put in place for this facility is going to make it a uh, a real jewel in our uh, our uh, our cycling facilities and not only i think it's going to become a bit of a tourist destination as well so huge congratulations to the team on that as we move to uh, built environment and infrastructure, uh, we talk about the right-of-way pro uh, program and, and essentially that's uh, the engineering uh, services. That's where their almost complete focus is within the right-of-way. And so when I alluded earlier to, you know, what the heck is Public Works doing during a lockdown, uh, one of the compliments that I need to throw out to Gord and his team, and as well as all of the capital delivery staff within Public Works, who traditionally would sit in offices, they had to pivot and move all of their uh, operations to a remote, remote locations, and the, those remote locations were almost exclusively people's homes. So Gordon and his team delivered delivered seventy six million dollars worth of right of way projects this year by creating the tenders, doing the design drawings, handling the procurement, and then doing the construction management all from people's homes, all remotely. That's an extraordinary achievement, and I, I think it's something that only a, a, a pandemic could have induced if we'd have tried to do this under normal circumstances, it probably would have taken us a lot longer to do it, but uh, Gord's team managed to pivot as well as our, our landscape architecture folks, as well as the capital delivery folks and Rome shop. They all pivoted in a matter of days in the early spring to get everything up and running from home. And I think the, uh, the metrics that you're seeing on the slide are an indication of the tremendous success we had, uh, notwithstanding the challenges that they've had to do that. So I won't, I won't dwell too long on the metrics that you see here. These will ebb and flow on an annual basis. You will see uh, red arrows down and green arrows up, and th those aren't necessarily indications of good or bad. Uh, sometimes our, our water main uh, and water and sewer inspections, we can do more in a given year, um, depending on the size of the pipe that we're looking at. The same goes for the, um, the rehabilitation that we do on an annual basis as well. And so, um, 
more than anything, just a, an indication of just how much work was being done throughout the year. One of the projects that we, we did undertake this year was uh, the front end uh, continuous improvement project to identify a prioritization scheme that we could use for projects that are out within the, the, right, the right of way. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of different interested parties who when we undertake a, a, a construction project wanna have some influence in the right of way, whether it's divisions within public works, be it the placement of bus, bus stops and bus shelters, be it the placement of street trees. Through this process, we have determined that there are 93 different inputs or pieces of guidance that our capital folks have to consider when they're doing the design of a right of way uh, project. So I think that project, uh, it wasn't set out for this reason, but it, it's identified just how extraordinary, extraordinarily complicated delivering right-of-way projects is, and I think gives a bit of a thumbnail sketch as to the challenges that Erica Waite and her team have to manage as they deliver these, these very important capital projects. I won't spend a lot of time on this one. It's really just a bit of a list of, of some of the, uh, the projects that we initiated this year. Uh, one of the things that you've heard from Gordon McGuire on a couple of occasions is the strategic asset management plan. We've also had this conversation at SLT and you're gonna hear an update uh, in the summer about core assets. And then subsequent to that, as we move broader corporately um, about a, a, a more comprehensive uh, coordinated uh, strategic asset management plan that's gonna be brought forward to council. This is a requirement of regulation that has been brought out from the province. And so, uh, can't emphasize that enough. Some of the other things that uh, I just wanted to identify was the conversion. We've had three two-way street conversions that have happened this year. Um, not only did they help uh, local businesses and change the local feel of our downtown, they did help to make our streets safer. I did speak earlier about the fact that we are in every way uh, first responders and uh, I'm sure Councillor Vanderbeek, our new chair of uh, Public Works will appreciate the photo in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, we did have to shut down the Highway 8 access through Dundas there as a result of a failure, uh, I think a couple of times last year. And finally, we were able to get out there with the capital replacement program. And um, the, the net result of that project has been very positive. And uh, just another example of, uh, I'll say the just-in-time delivery that we do on some of our projects, not always the best situation, but uh, the end product in this case was certainly uh, very good. So as I move through the presentation, I'm gonna take you on a bit of a virtual bus tour. I won't spend a lot of time on these uh, slides, but I do want council to have the opportunity to see uh, photos of some of the outcomes of the, the large capital budget that they approved in 2021, or 2020, forgive me, and as well for the community to see some of the, uh, uh, some of the capital and renewal that's happening throughout the community. When we think about outside the road allowance and we turn our mind to the facilities group, again, working remotely, Rome's staff delivered $55 million worth of capital throughout 2020, and which is in excess of their uh, rolling five-year average and across 174 different projects. So again, another great tribute to the, uh, the agility of Rome's team and some of the major projects are listed there below. And what you will see with the, um, with the 500 McNabb, while Rome's team is not responsible for asset management or the block funding associated with Hamilton Housing, we have uh, struck up a deal with them where we're delivering their large capital for them. So that's uh, that's important aspect of Rome's portfolio where we're trying to take a more corporate approach to to supporting the, the entire organization with the uh, and having the right people working in the right place. This was an interesting slide that Rome had uh, presented to me during his uh, his annual presentation to to me, and I thought it was worth sharing with uh, council. I won't spend a lot of time on this one either, but it just gives you a sense of the different areas where we get funding and the different roles that uh, Rome's team plays in supporting different parts of the organization. Again, back on the virtual bus tour here, just to give you a snapshot of some of the larger projects that uh, got completed in 2020, as well as are, uh, are in the midst of their schedules. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sticking with the theme of built environment and infrastructure, just a reminder that Hamilton was successful in attracting funding from the federal government through the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. Primarily, those funds are going to shoreline protection, and we're very pleased to uh, to have delivered the 50 Road Parquet project. I know that uh, Councillor Pearson and I believe Councillor Johnson from previous uh, experience are very familiar with this parquet. It's one of the uh, few windows to the lake along the trail and uh, it, it gets used uh, a fair bit. So it was very nice to see that get put back together in a must, much more robust way. So it will be 
uh, able to withstand future weather events and, and shoreline erosion. Uh, the other major project uh, that was supported through the, the DMAF was the West Harbour uh, Trail. And so council may remember that we brought forward uh, a revet revetment uh, specification for council's approval this year. So we're very uh, excited about me being able to move to uh, design and tender. We're hoping to award the contract for the West Harbour Trail in the fall of this year and deliver the actual construction works across the winter and spring of 2022. That's not the type of work you would traditionally uh, want to do in the winter time or in the early spring, but in order to observe the uh, the requirements of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and stay out of, keep the in-water work to the appropriate seasons, we do have to engage in that work in December. And then again, some uh, some parks work as identified in the, the list below. And, and as I take you on the tour of the different parks and play structures that were constructed throughout 2020, again, just uh, more evidence of the commitment that the that council has made through their uh, approval of the capital budget. Some of the distractions that the team had to deal with from a capital perspective this year. Uh, again, there's more images of the, at the bottom right, the, uh, the warehouse that Rome and his team set up as well as just a menagerie of plexiglass shields that Rome had to procure and install when we started to allow both staff to return to work as well as the uh, the public to start entering our facilities. So again, more more evidence of just the additional workload that uh, Rome and his team had to, uh, to manage throughout the year and uh, I would say did it very successfully. When we think about the uh, strategic pr priority of healthy and safe communities, certainly within the right of way, uh, our Vision Zero program is, is really the hallmark of keeping people safe and keeping the community uh, well as they travel around. One of the biggest projects that was uh, keeping Edward and his team busy this year was the, uh, the speed reduction program through a number of neighborhoods this year. Uh, happy to say that 54 neighborhoods were completed with the uh, the 40 kilometer an hour signs. Uh, I'm, I'm sure councillors might have received some questions uh, similar to the ones that I did that people were curious about the, the six by six posts that were appearing everywhere in the uh, community, but it wasn't support of the, the signage associated with the, uh, the neighborhood re, uh, speed reduction program. So I must admit that I remain a, 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 an eager student of transportation engineering and uh, with my teachers, Dave Ferguson, uh, Mike Shield and Edward Soldo, uh, just as a reminder for council that the, the five E's associated with Vision Zero, engineering, education, enforcement, evaluation, and empathy. And uh, every aspect of the five E's was engaged in this year, whether it was um, through traffic, uh, transportation design, whether it was through the outreach uh, that we are doing in the community to help people understand why we are trying to slow them down a little bit to make the road safer and make all users of the, and respect all users of the road, as well as enforcement. and. Um, and I know that Edward's team on a regular basis goes back to do evaluations on the changes that they've made to see if they're achieving the outcomes that they're looking for. As we look forward to uh, uh, Vision Zero and, and future tactics that we're going to undertake throughout the community to make our streets safer, uh, the complete streets guideline that was presented at Public Works uh, not long ago uh, had some, some key themes around it. And so again, another great partnership between uh, Brian Hollingworth, Edward Soldo, and Gord McGuire and developing the Complete Streets Guideline and the idea of having street typologies with an underlying focus on enhancing access and safety for all users of the road network. The uh, Complete Streets Guideline is it will be going out for uh, consultation in the community and hopefully approval through uh, the balance of this year. And that will prove a fundamental document for guiding our staff going forward as we look to make changes to make our streets safer and more efficient for all users of the road network. Again, I won't uh, I won't dwell too much on the metrics here on this slide. Uh, some of them go up and some of them go down in any given year, but it gives you a sense of the activity that occurred throughout uh, the transportation division as well as engineering services uh, to continue to change and modify our road networks uh, to serve the needs of the community. Again, from a health and safety perspective, uh, there's been lots of activity. I know from my own experience uh, over my career here, I, I've never seen as much activity in the City Hall forecourt as we've seen over the last couple of years. And so when it comes to uh, security in its strictest sense, I, I, can't, uh, I can't thank enough the efforts of uh, Delfina Duarte and, and uh, especially Martin Dambo and his team. For any of you councillors who have interacted with Martin, you'll know what an extraordinary find he was an acquisition to have him on our team. And he's done a really great job in, in moving us into a more uh, to a safer 
uh, place when it comes to our facilities, but doing it in a very uh, doing it in a very uh, respectful way. In addition to that, we've seen that some of the outcomes of our Vision Zero uh, initiatives over the last number of years have uh, resulted in a 24% reduction in injury collisions. In addition, I believe we've seen a 33% decrease in cyclist uh, injuries over the last number of years. So no question when we undertake initiatives like this, it's with an outcome in mind. And I think it's safe to say that our Vision Zero activities in this community over the last number of years have achieved the outcome that we're looking for. And uh, we certainly, uh, for lack of a better analogy, we kept our foot on the gas with these initiatives uh, throughout 2020, despite all the challenges that we, uh, we, uh, we had to deal with. Again, you can't talk about transportation networks without talking about automated speed enforcement and the red light camera program. I think council's probably very aware that uh, uh, implementing the automated speed enforcement, we've had some challenges with vandalism and um, the fact that we've issued 20,000 tickets might have something to do with the fact that we're seeing the vandalism, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, we're gonna continue to make sure that we, we uh, forge on through that pilot and learn as much as we possibly can to determine whether or not the community safety zones that these cameras are being installed in, if it's if we're trying to if we're achieving the outcome that we're looking for, the early signs are, is that we uh, that we are excuse me that we are seeing the outcome we're looking for with an average of a five kilometer an hour speed reduction at the locations where we've had the uh, the ASC cameras. Uh, in addition to that, the red light camera program has been around for a long time and uh, again, having uh, significant uh, positive outcomes with the reduction of right angle collisions and uh, and the reduction in injury and fatal collisions at those locations. So all of these tactics work together. Uh, there's no silver bullet for any of these issues, but they're all working together and they're moving us towards a, a safer a safer community for people who are traveling through it. One of the strategic priorities uh, in our strategic plan is, is our people in performance. And so there's a photograph for those who don't know of our landscape architecture team. And, you know, it's always a pleasure for me to interact with these folks because they are always so knowledgeable and thoughtful in the way that they deliver projects. And it's no, it's not lost on me that the, uh, the great talent that we have uh, in that group and the way that they perform their duties is, uh, I think it's an, an example of speed of the leader, speed of the pack. And I think that comes from the way that Cynthia Graham conducts herself. And so uh, um, I think the uh, th that's representative of where we wanna go as an organization with our teams. And so we think about COVID and the effect that it's had on our staff. Um, I, I think this slide is probably uh, more in support of the great work that Laura Fontana and her team have done over the last number of years in developing supports for staff, whether it's around mental health training, whether it's around mental health supports, or whether it's just about um, opportunities to, to look for resources online to help our staff manage the different stresses that occur at work and at home. And so there's no question that throughout 2020 with the pandemic, every level of staff in the organization has availed themselves to these situations, whether um, the pandemic has required them to work from home, whether it's required them to work to isolate from their families, it has created a lot of stress for our staff. And so uh, I think the city's done a, a very good job in supporting and uh, uh, assisting our staff uh, in these extraordinary times. So if, if I take you behind the curtain from an administrative perspective with Public Works and I talk about the CVOR, which is the Commercial Vehicle Operators Registration. This is uh, a registration that is uh, provided by the Ministry of Transport and applies to large fleets that have vehicles that are in excess of 4,500 kilograms. And what the province has determined uh, over a long period of time is that they have a point system and they wanna be able to hold owners of large fleets accountable for the way that their fleets operate out in the community. And so there is a point system here uh, that we have to manage on a daily basis. And I would say that the, the CVOR is the administrative equivalent of having a toddler playing with scissors. And, and while I'm making light of that a little bit, the point I'm making is that we on a daily basis have to pay very close attention to our CVOR because if our points rise too high, um, we do risk losing our registration, which could theoretically uh, uh, ground our entire fleet. And so uh, it's a point process. And I, I don't mind admitting that about a year and a half ago, we were starting to get in trouble with highway traffic DAC violations and minor accidents that were contributing to points that uh, 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 conspired to raise our, our point total up into the 80s, which then triggered a meeting for us to have with the Ministry of Transport. 
But I do want to give a uh, congratulations both to uh, Tom Kajianis and Sherry Connolly in Fleet, as well as the uh, the teams within Edward Soldo's shop, uh, Andrew Grice and Craig Murdoch. As a team, uh, they took on the uh, CVOR to find out what was causing this, uh, you know, pre precipitous rise in our points, as well as to find out how do we how do we manage this over the long term. And so again, looking for outcomes, our, our CVOR total this week is around 38 points, which is a huge success story. And I think we've got programs and uh, policies in place now to make sure that we never find ourselves in trouble with this again. But, uh, you know, I, I think it is, you know, it, it's the annual opportunity for me to give council a sense of some of the things that happen in behind the scenes to make sure that public works functions properly. Again, we talk, talked about pivoting. Um, and using technology to assist our, our delivery of services out in the community. And so the use of tablets is something that we had already started to do uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, but we amped that up throughout the pandemic and it really has illustrated how the use of technology is gonna be fundamental to how we deliver our services going forward. Uh, one of the victims of 2020 in the pandemic was our leadership development program. While we were still able to provide some of the leadership development opportunities that we've uh, uh, created over the last number of years, uh, some of the in-person um, interactions with our future leaders were put on hold. And, and from a personal perspective, that was very disappointing for me because I really enjoy getting out there and meeting our future leaders in the organization and helping them prepare themselves to take on greater responsibility as we see uh, exodus of senior staff. You may recognize this presentation or this slide from my presentation last year, and it's one that hasn't changed much, but that I, I like to include because it really speaks to the idea that at the general manager level, the director level, and certainly at the manager level, we need to spend a lot of our time thinking, working on the organization as opposed to working in it. And the reason for that is if we're gonna continually improve and we're gonna uh, uh, ensure the quality of service to our residents and the efficiency of our programs, we have to do things like, uh, create dashboards and look at how we measure our processes and improve on our project management um, processes because we do so much capital delivery. So I have a regular conversation with the directors about how much time they're spending working on the organization versus in. And that's a quick way for me to check on whether or not we're spending time on the right things. And um, you know, I've alluded to the, to the work that uh, Craig Murdoch has had to do this year. I suspect that 2020 did not represent a year where he was working on things as much as he was working in. Um, but it is something that, ha that, that I have to pay attention to the general, as the general manager to make sure that we are, uh, we're improving our processes and, 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 and getting ready for the future. Again, some, just, uh, some more examples of, of how we do that, uh, whether it's the uh, strategic framework, quality management, uh, workforce planning with our partners in HR, scorecard, Arts and uh, Public Works Analytics. I'm gonna talk briefly about that in some future slides. And one of the things that we're seeking to do is make sure that we're standardize, standardizing the processes and the language that we use across all of Public Works to make sure that when we're delivering projects, we're all speaking the same language and that we're engaging our stakeholders at the right time and that we're delivering projects that deliver the successful outcomes. Community engagement, another strategic priority that we paid attention to this year, notwithstanding our uh, our current environment. I won't spend a lot of time on there, but this, but there's just some examples of how we engaged with the community throughout 2020, notwithstanding the fact that our traditional ways of doing that were challenged. Economic prosperity and growth. So again, often uh, any efforts that we put forward with respect to economic prosperity and growth relate to our interactions with planning and economic development. One of the great success stories this year was the Bell Project. And uh, I know council's aware that Bell Canada is making a significant investment. I think their media release had indicated they want to spend $400 million in the city of Hamilton over a four year period. This is an example of where us as staff and public works play a critical enabling role to make sure that Bell can get their work done in the timeframes that they want to do. And so, uh, again, another uh, shout out to Gordon McGuire, Dave Lamont, Rob Merritt, who developed the processes to allow for Bell to get the approvals necessary and the consents from us to work within our right of way so that they can lay as much fiber optic cable as they possibly can in a short a period of time. And just by uh, further evidence to the success of this program, I had the good fortune to have a phone call with Bruce Furlong, who is the senior vice president of Bell Canada. And he shared with me um, the fact that he had a conversation with the premier 
uh, and he was extolling the uh, the benefits of the program that he saw here in Hamilton. And he said, whenever he finds extra money to spend anywhere, he's spending it in Hamilton because he knows he can spend it in Hamilton and he won't get held back with these bureaucratic processes. So, so a huge shout out to Gordon's team for developing the, the mechanisms and the process to get that uh, project done quickly. Again, I know that Jason alluded to the projects that are supporting growth at the airport. And so uh, Andrew sp spoke to the fact that uh, in, in the, a complete change to his work plan at the end of 2019, he undertook the release of 16 different requests for proposals and requests for tenders to, to deal with the increase of capacity to the three pumping stations that will allow the growth at the airport to occur in a timely fashion. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm confident that those projects will all be delivered this year, uh, notwithstanding ministry approvals, but uh, we're in very good shape. And I think it's a great illustration of how agile we can be when we need to be in delivering capital. Again, Jason alluded to some of the great work that's happened down at the waterfront, Gord McGuire through his very small but mighty team of Gavin Norman, Ed English, and uh, the now retired uh, Jeff Pitsadney. Uh, for anybody who's traveled down there, you will see that all the site servicing is in place, the base course asphalt, all the curbs, the pump station, the shore wall, everything is in place now uh, for us to now move towards the, uh, the proponent to start building those uh, condos down there. So uh, very excited about the, the work that's been done down there and, and need to point out that um, the project itself down there won the Ontario, or not, excuse me, the Brownie Award, which is a recognition of how brownfields are being converted across Canada into productive uses. So I think that's just more evidence of the, uh, the, the what an exciting project that was and what a great accomplishment it was to get that over the finish line from a servicing perspective in 2021. But additionally, I know that Jason talked about the park promenade and uh, so I won't, uh, I won't elaborate on that. The last thing I'll speak to on this slide is a partnership that uh, Public Works started with uh, Grace Mater's shop and Al Fletcher a number of years ago in, in conjunction with the Hand Association and Leuna. It's the, it's the youth in construction project. So this is a an initiative that sees youth at risk uh, being trained for construction jobs. And uh, notwithstanding the pandemic, we saw nine uh, young people go through that program and they're all headed off to uh, either further training or employment. And so I really wanna give a shout out to Irene Heffernan and Rob, uh, Rob uh, Brown and Grace uh, Mater's shop because uh, while this was uh, inspired uh, in public works, uh, it's really being run and the success of this program is really attributable to, uh, to Irene and her gang over there, but uh, it's it's got a great personal value to me. So I always like to just mention it here. Again, a bit of a virtual bus tour here, just so you can see some of the uh, some of the projects that uh, that were delivered this year. In the bottom left photograph, you'll see an image of the, the trunk sewer that is being uh, going to go out for tender this year. And this is the long-term servicing to the airport. One of the things that we engaged in this year was some value engineering, and I know that this may resonate with Councillor Ferguson and, and Councillor Danko. Um, so Cole Engineering did the uh, the uh, the uh, de detailed design on this, uh, but throughout uh, the latter part of 2021, we engaged in value engineering. So we brought in another consultant, uh, a gentleman named Bob Fleet, who has long history in the consulting engineering industry, as well as we brought in a very well-known retired tunnel expert by the name of Mike McNally. And if, for anybody who knows the name McNally, they know that it has a rich history in tunneling. Uh, so we did some value engineering sessions uh, on this project and found, uh, identified um, significant risks that we have now been able to uh, make sure we can mitigate through the project. Uh, a lot of extra geotech that's gonna be done on the, on the project to understand our soil conditions. Uh, we went to this extra level of analysis upfront because this is such a fundamental a piece of infrastructure that's gonna serve the airport going forward. We wanna make sure that we meet our delivery timelines on it. So uh, I know both Gord and I are feeling very positive about the work that was done through the value engineering and are feeling very confident that we should be able to meet our, our schedule on this project. Tunneling is inherently a difficult uh, task to undertake. Uh, it's very rare that you meet your schedule with tunneling and that you meet your budget. So any any work that you can do up front uh, to ensure success is is money well spent. From a culture and diversity perspective, there were some neat things that happened in public works this year. I'll just give you a couple quick examples. The Moby mat that was being used down at the uh, down at the, the lakefront has been uh, a real successful, uh, we've seen a real success as a result of that. The community has complimented on uh, the, the fact that it now provides easy access for those folks who need it uh, to enjoy the uh, the waterfront. 
In addition to that, the wheelchair swing at Gage Park. I know we're going to be looking for other opportunities to install these types of devices in other parks. And then lastly, the uh, the dynamic symbol for uh, for wheelchair users. Uh, these are things that uh, may not necessarily be associated kind of in a typical public works uh, uh, thought process, but it's again, it's us looking for ways that we can support the strategic objectives when it comes to culture and diversity across the community. Again, with that same theme, we're looking for different ways to reach out to those who speak other languages, people who are new Canadians to help participate in our, in our waste diversion programs as well, uh, looking for ways for our cemeteries group to be respectful of the fact that uh, different uh, people have different needs depending on their cultural needs when it comes to uh, uh, losing loved ones. And so I know our cemeteries folks are very sensitive to this and looking for ways to make sure that they can be supportive of those cultural needs that might be different than from what we've tradi traditionally done. Quality management, one of the things that we, again, from an administrative perspective that we uh, completed this year was the set of guiding principles for our quality management system. Uh, again, these are the, uh, the processes that work behind the scenes from an administrative perspective to lower risk relative to the things that we do in the community. But the other thing that these uh, quality management system does is sets us up very good for when we see an exodus of senior staff and corporate knowledge, because you're, we're documenting all of our key processes to make sure that things are done consistently and all of that in, that uh, inherent knowledge that exists within the minds of their senior staff is not lost when they move on to other things. Again, you see lots of images with the, uh, with the arrows moving in a circle, and this is really predicated on the Deming Loop from Lean Manufacturing, the Plan, Do, Check, Act. And uh, some of the things that you'll see on the slide here, uh, I mentioned earlier the 30 control procedures that, that were developed through the EOC this year and were instrumental to make sure that our staff were following the right protocols. One of the things that we began uh, setting our minds to through 2020 and we'll be looking to expand in 2021 is our audit program, our internal audit program to make sure that any of the changes that we make to our processes are having the desired effect and we're achieving the uh, the desired outcomes. Continue. And um, I, I think it's important for committee to hear uh, some, of the, some of the messages that are associated with the slide. I'm gonna focus on the box right in the center. And this is about the recovered capacity that we've identified as a result of some of the continuous improvement projects that we've undertaken. So, Two things that I would think would be top of mind for uh, council would be, can you do more with the same staff that you have and have you been able to reduce your budgets? Uh, I am a little bit disappointed that we, through our continuous improvement program this year, we were not unable to identify any significant cost reductions, but we, we were able to identify about a half a million dollars in recovered capacity. And by way of an example, what that means is when our staff are undertaking a process and they can improve that process and they can free up their time, what that allows us to do is have staff now available to get to the things that we either can't get to or to deal with the unending uh, pressures that we see from the growth that's occurring in the city of Hamilton. So later on in a future slide, I'm gonna talk about the fact that these four divisions that I'm focusing on today have essentially asked for no staff for the past five budget cycles, I think is an indication that the recovered capacity that we're identifying through our continuous improvement programs is really having a meaningful effect. In addition to that, this, this entire program is really predicated on engaging the front line. And so uh, one of the unexpected benefits that I've observed from this program is just the tremendous positive effect that it has had on our culture throughout Public Works. The frontline staff being engaged and, and, and being asked their opinions about how we can improve their process has really been almost magical in some ways because it really has improved our, uh, I would say, our, our culture across the entire department. I've included asset metrics here, and, and uh, I think council's probably very familiar with a lot of these. These are more for fun than anything, I guess, and really for those folks who may be uh, watching and listening online in the community. And it really just in a snapshot gives you a sense of how big Public Works is and the amount of assets that we manage. In the same vein, these are performance metrics. I won't spend a lot of time on them, recognizing that some of them go up and down in any given year, but really just gives a snapshot of the, uh, uh, the numbers, Public Works by the numbers, if you will and shows uh, kind of what our folks have been up to even in a pandemic year. Performance measurement, I know there's always a debate about whether or not government can behave like business. And I, I think there's an answer in there somewhere that sounds like 
we, we can never be a profit oriented uh, business. We, we have to use trust and confidence by our stakeholders and our community as a proxy for profit. But I think we should have a very disciplined and very strong interest in measuring what we do. And so this is the journey we've been on in public works over the last five years to do a better job at managing what we do so that we can do a better job of delivering the services and, and achieving better outcomes. By way of examples, the slide illustrates some of the dashboards that we've created over the last number of years and, and gives you a sense of the types of things that we're paying much more attention to. If you don't understand the mes metrics that drive your business, you don't understand your business. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the slide or necessarily focus you on any particular metric, but these are just examples of some of the dashboards that we're using across public works to help us make better decisions and to provide our, provide our services in a more efficient way. If you're going to do that, you need to uh, to be transparent and share some of this information with the community. So here's some of the here's some of the things we like to share with the community about uh, things that are going well. So the uh, the walk signal with the green band around it means that we're uh, we're either achieving our targets or exceeding them. Uh, but in the uh, the interest of full disclosure and being transparent, we also need to be upfront about some of the things that we were less successful on. So there's an example of some of the things where we didn't necessarily hit the targets that we wanted. Uh, but uh, it's important for the community to know that we're measuring these things. And so I know that one of the things that might jump out on this slide is the adverse uh, water quality events that happened in the drinking water systems throughout 2020. Uh, these are things that I don't want to characterize them as not being important. Every one of these incidents is important, but there's no need for alarm with these. They've been well managed and all the uh, protocols that are to be followed were managed or followed. And so uh, Andrew Grice will, will be uh, speaking to these when he brings the annual summary report in March which Hamilton Water is compelled to do through regulation. So you can look for more information on that uh, when he brings that forward. So as we look forward throughout uh, 21 to 24, the trends and issues that we're expecting, again, this is a repeat of some of what you've heard already, but we're gonna have to deal with the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 throughout 2021. One of the things that we talk about and I'll allude to in some future slides is just the reinvestment rate that we're seeing in our roads program and our right of way program. And the fact that um, it, it'll always be a pressure and it'll always be a point of conversation with council about how much money we invest back into our transportation networks. I'm gonna talk in a future slide about the excess soils regulation, as well as the complete streets guideline. But all of these things are gonna play a major role in how we respond and, and how we plan our work going forward in the, uh, the period of 21 to 24. I'm, I'm sure council will recognize this slide. I include it in, on an annual basis in my presentation and it just gives more recent examples of how we measure the condition of our road network. And so the roads and bridges is part of the core assets that will need to be reported on in June. And uh, at some point we're gonna have to talk about service levels and what the reinvestment rates are, not only to maintain a certain condition index across our entire transportation network, but in order to make sure we're, we've got a service delivery level uh, that the community is content with and that council will approve. When we move off the road allowance and we get into our facilities, it's essentially the same story, although the condition uh, rating index is, is kind of an inverse of the one that we use on the road. Uh, you like to see a high number on the road, but with our condition indexes and the facilities, you prefer to see a lower number. So that just gives you some of the examples of the uh, asset conditions and the different systems that Rome has to deal with when he's managing all of these facilities. It just gives you a real visual sense of what uh, what a good, uh, fair, poor, and critical condition looks like. Climate change is gonna be big on the agenda as we move forward. Uh, from a public works perspective, the four broad categories of, of uh, climate change that we traditionally have to deal with is water quality, flood mitigation, greenhouse gases, and invasive species. And I think uh, the priority uh, of all of those has to be greenhouse gas reduction and, and all the different ways that we are sending carbon into the atmosphere. And so uh, Tom Chessman will be bringing a revamp of the corporate energy policy throughout 2021. And um, one of the key things that you'll see in that is a change in some of our goals as we move forward into the future. But I know that uh, Tom and his team have continued to do an extraordinary job at uh, paying attention to the latest science and continuing to use their imagination to come up with projects like LED replacement, uh, like uh, water reduction strategies and a variety of other things, either moving projects on their own or working in conjunction with some of our other capital delivery staff. 
I will maybe just uh, follow up on a question that came up yesterday. So the photograph in the bottom right hand corner of the comp compressed natural gas bus. I can confirm for you today that the last diesel bus that we purchased and put into service happened in 2012. Since that time, we have only been buying natural gas buses. And so I think it is appropriate that Council uh, approves the resolution uh, directing staff to continue on that path to make sure that we are uh, doing the right things when it comes to uh, environment friendly propulsion systems for our transit fleet. Again, this was in my presentation last year, and this is an outcome of some of the good work that Arlen Leeming is doing in my shop. Uh, this is the framework by which we, as public works, are going to envision the future to determine how our services and how our assets will be provided and operated in the future. If we don't understand what they are going to look like in the future, we're not going to understand how to get there. And so Arlen has been doing some really good work this year, working with academia. He's been working in consultation with McMaster University as well as City Lab to start to flush out some of the details around how do we envision the future and how do we chart a, a path uh, to a future that's more, that's kinder to the environment. So very pleased with the uh, the work that Arlen's been doing and uh, looking forward to, to this year and really kind of getting engaged and, and kind of crunching through the details on that plan. I mentioned earlier at the start of my presentation that we are first responders in the true sense of the word. And so uh, one of the things that we always have to be prepared for is whatever the weather brings us or whatever our infrastructure brings us as far as unplanned events. And so lots of examples throughout 2020. And I know that our staff will be continuing to uh, to be great, uh, to do great work in this uh, in this respect going forward. Uh, I included this slide last year uh, for the first time, and I, I felt it was important to to bring it forward again this year. I did have an opportunity to speak to Sam, Sam Scarlett about the uh, uh, the forestry uh, program, and I know that um, I believe Planning Committee just recently heard an update on the urban forest strategy, and we're going out for public consultation on that now. Uh, the the canopy. Uh, cover throughout the community remains at around 21.2%. Um, haven't seen a dramatic change in that over the last number of years. And in some ways that's bad and in some ways it's good. And I will, I will, I will say to you that the fact that we've had to take over 20,000 ash trees out of our inventory, mature ash trees that represent a huge canopy um, is, 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 is sad. It's, it's a, it's a sad event and it's, it's an illustration of, uh, some of the new realities that we're experiencing as a result of climate change. But the fact that our overall canopy didn't change much as a result of that is an indication of just uh, the health of our overall canopy. The ultimate stretch goal for our canopy is 30%. And uh, the hope is that through the, uh, the upcoming strategy and the continued support of council, I will say that this council has been very supportive of the street tree programs and the free tree giveaways. Um, but the reality is we just cannot plant enough trees fast enough. and so. Uh, we're going to continue to look for opportunities to diversify the species that we're planting and the opportunities to get more trees in the ground because we know when you take out a big mature tree uh, and all the benefits that ha that has from climate from a climate mitigation perspective you have to you have to plant many many new young trees before you'll ever achieve the canopy replacement that you lost with that single tree so uh not to be all doom and gloom on that i think i think we're in a decent place on this now but we need to uh we need to certainly pay more attention to this going forward Contract renewals, again, getting back to the uh, uh, to the challenging waste portfolio. Much of what we do in waste is contracted out and the uh, services are provided by contractors. So, so this is just a snapshot of some of the budget pressures that we're experiencing in 2021 as a result of uh, budgeting or contractual increases or the fact that we've gone out to tender and we have new contracts coming on board. And so the curbside waste collection is an example of that. Uh, we went out to tender and we have a new operating contract, uh, GFL. Who, who to date has been a very good uh, partner for us uh, from a contracting perspective, but we do see a $2.9 million pressure just in 21 as a result of the, of the conclusion of that new contract. One of the areas that we did uh, hope that we were gonna see some relief from a budget perspective was the transfer station contract. Uh, but as council knows, we are in the, uh, in the midst of uh, working through some challenges with the, uh, the contract there. And uh, hopefully we will continue to, re to enjoy the uh, uh, the budget relief that that contract uh, was is anticipated to provide. I did want to include some additional information about automated speed enforcement. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, this program is creating is on the back end and the administrative process that inevitably occurs from the fact 
that when people do receive the ticket, they do have an opportunity to challenge it in court. And so this is creating a, a pretty significant demand from a, a POA perspective, both at the courthouse and administratively within the city of Hamilton. And so I can tell you that Dave Ferguson is working with the provincial working group to determine whether or not there's a better, more efficient way to deal with um, uh, ASE as well as red light camera violations. And that is through an AMP program, which is administrative monetary penalties. So this is similar to what you would see through the uh, parking tickets and the way that we adjudicate parking tickets internally. Uh, we're hopeful that we would move in this direction because the expense associated with the POA to support this program is really eat, starting to eat into some of the revenues that we're getting from this program and, and thereby not making them available for road safety programs. And so that was my lead up to this slide. I do wanna make council aware that uh, under the current uh, kind of arc of this program, we do see that the red light camera reserve will be fully spent by around 2025. I guess the upshot of this is that if, if this does occur, uh, the, the road safety programs that I know the community is so hungry for will then have to be provided through the levy. And so uh, we do have to remember that whether it's the red light camera reserve or the automated speed enforcement, the ultimate goal here is, is to have people drive safer. Um, and so as hopefully as we achieve those outcomes, the need for those cameras will diminish over time. Uh, but we will, uh, if things don't change um, one way or the other over the short term, we will start to see a budget pressure as it relates to our road safety programs. From a workforce management perspective, uh, again, I know Jason alluded to this yesterday, uh, the difficulty of filling skilled roles. And I must say, I was having a, a bit of a nostalgic moment yesterday when uh, Jason talked about Sally Young Lee. Uh, Sally actually hired me uh, into the organization in 1994. So I have a very uh, long history with Sally and I don't, uh, I don't disagree that uh, with her departure, we will be losing a lot of corporate knowledge uh, in the organization. And I think that's just one example of a lot of senior staff who will, over the next uh, short period of time, have the opportunity to leave and replacing that kind of corporate knowledge is very difficult. And I will advise that when I think about the, the eight senior staff in public works uh, that represent kind of the senior leadership in public works, six of those staff will achieve their magic numbers within the next 18 to 24 months. So this is an issue that's top of mind, uh, has to be top of mind in, as we look towards the future to make sure that uh, the city will be well managed over the longer term. And I know from a public works perspective, we've got some really great uh, future leaders coming up through the ranks. And so uh, I think public works is in great shape, but uh, it is an issue that we have to pay close attention to. One of the things that uh, public works has to deal with on a regular basis that may not be evident to, to residents of the community is just the ongoing churn and grind of provincial and federal regulation that is released on a regular basis that tells us how to do our work. And so this is just a snapshot of some of them. Uh, there's a lot more than this, but these are the ones that are gonna have the most tangible effects uh, for public works over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, again, the strategic asset management plan, I've alluded to that on a number of occasions throughout the presentation. That's gonna uh, uh, change the way that we do our, our planning around capital assets. Um, one of the changes that we did benefit from was the when we were declared non-construction employers and so that opened up our ability to have more uh, contractors bid on our jobs. One of the things that is uh, worrisome to me and I know uh, our leadership group is the regulation around contaminated soils. So it's that bullet after one or part of uh, Reg 406 under the Environmental Protection Act. This is gonna create uh, expense for the city and it's gonna create some challenges in how we manage our soils especially the ones that as a result of this new regulation are gonna be declared as waste. I, I know that council has uh, heard and is aware of some of the issues around soils, whether it is uh, you know, some of the situations we've seen in Flamborough where uh, dumping is occurring on properties and having an adverse effect on the neighbors, or whether it is us as municipal staff identifying contaminated soils on our sites, the most recent of which was the Kenilworth Reservoir this is an issue that is going to become front and center for us and we have to get ahead of it, not only in, in identifying the best ways to manage uh, contaminated soils when we do find them, but also how to manage them efficiently and to make sure that we are compliant with any of the new regs that come out under the, uh, um, the, the EPA. And then the, the other one that I feel I should mention uh, uh, relative to this slide is the blue box program. And that's gonna have some pretty dramatic effects on how 
uh, recyclable material is managed over the longer term. So the city has to pay close attention to that over the next many months to make sure that we're, we're ready for those regulations when they change. Some of the other issues that are always on here, the global adjustment benefit. And again, I, uh, I'll allude to the great work that Tom Chessman does in connection with the big energy users across public works. This represents a $6 million risk on, a reg on an annual basis to our budget. We do not budget for the global adjustment. Uh, what we do is we manage our peak demand days so that we don't get hit with uh, any kind of penalties around that. Uh, and that's really reliant on the great work that Tom and his team do. So that's something that's not going away. Our aging fuel sites, 17 of our 20 fuel sites currently are, are older than 20 years. So we know that we're gonna have to have a strategy on how we manage them going forward. Uh, I won't read every one of these bullets, but needless to say, these are things that uh, are not obvious in the way that we deliver service every day to the community, but are things that our leadership group has to sort out in the background and make sure that we manage on a regular basis. One of the conversations that we have had at SLT, and I know uh, Council has had it recently, is how do we deal with the, uh, the budget pressures that are created through growth? Well, we do have mechanisms through our budget process to identify and, and uh, accommodate the uh, uh, operating um, expenses associated with the capital programs. We don't necessarily have uh, a protocol to do that uh, as it relates to growth. So I know that's something that we're gonna be turning our minds to as a senior leadership group going forward. In addition to that, uh, the wonderful metrics that Jason shared with you yesterday around growth and building permits, uh, Public Works plays a, a pretty important role in some of those approval processes as well. And so we've been uh, pretty agile in using consultants and finding other ways to speed up those processes as we go forward because it's not unusual for an exciting development to be brought forward to the city. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the buzzkill moment on that is often uh, when we're looking at the water and the wastewater servicing for that. So uh, I. I Andrew's team has, has been very uh, uh, creative in trying to find ways to make our processes faster and, and to help with those, uh, with those approvals. I believe it was Councillor Clark that had, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe you had raised this uh, through early budget meetings about the sidewalk program through and some of the issues that you're experiencing in your ward. Subsequent to yep. that, I believe it was Councillor Pearson that had asked if I could bring some information through this budget presentation that speaks specifically to the, the sidewalk program. And so I'm gonna endeavor to do that now. So uh, the minimum maintenance standards is a set of standards and guidelines that was established by the province of Ontario to guide municipalities in a variety of ways, not just um, sidewalks, but to guide municipalities so that they could create work processes that would allow the municipality to defend itself against any claims of negligence or liability when it comes to all aspects of things that happen within the right of way. And so specifically as it relates to sidewalks, what that means is uh, under a minimum maintenance standard, you on an annual basis, you have to inspect all of your sidewalks. You have to identify any that have a, uh, a discontinuity of more than two centimeters, and then you have to deal with it. There's a variety of ways that you can deal with it. You can pad it with asphalt, you can grind it, you can replace the sidewalk. But at the end of the day, it's that inspection process and that follow-up um, activity that forms the defense that the municipality has to any claims. And so you have to take reasonable measures to protect the users and make sure that they're aware if there's something wrong, whether that's through signage or other ways, or um, take the tactics that I previously mentioned. So by way of um, some examples, if you look at some of the photographs on the previous slide and on this one, you'll see some examples of MMS deficiencies and non-MMS deficiencies. And it's important to think about what a deficiency might look like that's non-MMF. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, draw your attention to the photograph in the top right-hand corner. So that is concrete spalling. And um, that happens sometimes as a result of the way the concrete was installed, whether there was too much finishing that was happening whether or not calcium was used as a result of being placed in cold weather, that kind of thing. People in the community may view that as something that needs to be replaced, but that doesn't necessarily trigger an MMS deficiency. So I wanted to make sure that there was clarity around what is an MMS deficiency and what isn't, because cracks in sidewalks on their own may aesthetically look unpleasing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna respond to do something about it if it doesn't trigger uh, an MMS uh, contravention. So on an annual basis, we're out there inspecting the sidewalks, the whole 2,400 kilometers of them, 
And in 2019, Edwards team identified just over 4,000 MMS deficiencies, but also we captured 136,000 other deficiencies. And so I am spending a bit of time talking about the other deficiencies because I know that counselors often receive phone calls to their office about problems with sidewalks. And my suspicion is that often those calls are for deficiencies that are not MMS, that don't strictly need to be addressed because they are more aesthetic. And so the map uh, on the bottom right just shows you an example of the, uh, the tracking system and the tablet and the mapping system that Edwards team uses to identify where those deficiencies are so that then our staff can go out, our maintenance staff, and take the appropriate measures to make sure that those pieces of sidewalk are safe. Edward has identified that if we were to try to go out and fix all those deficiencies in one season, it would be about a $44 million touch. And on an annual basis, we have about uh, $6 million devoted to our, uh, our sidewalk program. So there's a delta of about $38 million. So uh, spreadsheets aren't necessarily the best way to deliver PowerPoint presentations, but I will ask you to just uh, walk through this one briefly with me. I'm gonna illustrate this information differently on, a, on the next slide, but if I focus you on row one, uh, the transportation group, what you see here is an example of the types of work that Edwards team does when it comes to sidewalk maintenance. We're showing you the type of budget that we have for it, where that budget comes from, and how it's completed. Some of this work is done with, with Edwards staff directly, and some of it was done with contractors. And at the end of the day, if you look at the gray row, just below row one, you'll see that Edwards team is accountable for about 0.8% replacement of the entire sidewalk portfolio on an annual basis. If I focus you now on rows two, three, and four, this is sidewalk work that gets done through engineering services and Gordon McGuire's shop and is exclusively done with contractors. But again, I show you the different funding sources and uh, on an annual basis, Gord delivers about 0.7 replacement of the entire sidewalk inventory. So if you focus on the blue row, just below Gord section, you'll see that on an annual basis through all sidewalk activities, we are replacing about 1.5% of our sidewalk inventory. That represents, um, I did the math yesterday, the number's escaping me, but I think it's around a 62 year life cycle replacement for our sidewalks. In the Canadian environment, that is not a good number. Um, I think the best estimates that uh, the, the, the industry suggests is uh, uh, a two to 3% uh, investment in your sidewalk replacement so that you can get the life cycle down to around 40 years. Some sidewalks at the age of 60 look pretty good, but most of them are in pretty bad shape. And so I think that's, uh, I think that's what council is hearing from the community is that they're seeing this and uh, we're just we're just putting this into numbers for them. The last row that I'll focus you on is the road cut program. So often in the community, you'll see that sidewalk slabs are being replaced. Uh, it has nothing to do with MMS or even our uh, life cycle replacement. This is strictly related to where utilities are being installed, whether it's the Bell project or gas or hydro doing underground utilities or where there's a new water and sewer service going into a private property. And so that represents about 2.2% uh, of our entire inventory. So this is uh, a different way of just expressing the, the same information. Uh, it may be more uh, digestible for, uh, for folks. I won't spend too much time on it. Um, so if I, if I just stick with this for a minute, so um, I'm hoping that answers the questions uh, that, uh, that have, uh, that were raised as a part of the previous uh, deliberations around sidewalks. And uh, certainly expect uh, that uh, Gordon, his team will, and Edward will be ready for questions as it relates to that specific program uh, once I get to the end here. So specifically looking at 2021, again, uh, lots of activity gonna be happening in the right of way on some pretty major projects. Again, we're gonna be uh, facilities in Rome delivering his uh, project portfolio. Um, won't spend a lot of time on this slide. I know that uh, this is a fairly lengthy presentation and I wanna drive through it uh, as quick as I can. Again, 2021, um, Edward's gonna be working on his operational plan for the link in the Red Hill Valley. This is a, a pretty significant piece of work that is related to the quality management program that Edward is implementing in transportation. Uh, the master office space management plan. I'm excited. Uh, one of the things I can tell you is that I've been working from home since last March, so about uh, 10, almost 11 months now. I haven't had an office since last August. So um, I'm looking forward to the improvements that are occurring in the Stelco Tower so that I've got an office to return to. Again, the waste program. Uh, I think we're gonna spend a lot of time speaking with council about the waste program over the next couple of years. 
looking to implement year nine of the 10 year Emerald Ash Pour program. I'm uh, very pleased, I'm sure Craig is as well, that that program is right on track. Uh, we had anticipated to get it ten, done in 10 years and it looks like we'll have it done in 10 years. Year five of the 10 year local transit strategy. Again, another exciting uh, improvement to our services to the community. More work ahead. I, I alluded to this in an earlier slide that uh, the internal audit program, as bureaucratic as that might sound, uh, that's going to be a very important piece of work going forward for Public Works. Looking ahead, one of the key projects that's going to, uh, it, it's a long term investment. Council may remember this report to Council. It's the Enterprise Asset Management Program. And this is converting the 11 existing software programs that we have across Public Works into one program. This is a heavy lift. I am very pleased with the progress that we've made with this project throughout this year, considering that we are living through a pandemic. Uh, in another few months, we are really gonna be getting into the guts of this project. And I think we're gonna make tremendous progress over the next couple of years. When we come out the other side of this project, uh, our ability to report and show analytics to council will be much more enhanced. And we're gonna have a lot more information and data available to help us guide the delivery of our services as we go forward. Again, exploring new technology, um, whether we're losing skilled staff or not, uh, the demands of the community and the ability to extend the lives of our assets uh, requires uh, the use and the exploration of new technology on a regular basis. I had a, I had a conversation with Gord McGuire yesterday. I, I don't know if there's any material that we buy more of as an organization than asphalt and it's expensive. And it's a, it's a tremendous investment. And I, I'm pleased to announce that the quality management program that has been developed in Gorge Shop over the last couple of years has seen uh, the quality of our asphalt placement rise from 96% compliance to, to into the 99 range. Um, Gord has been responding to an audit that Charles Brown has been doing for uh, several months now about quality management around our asphalt program. We are very anxious to see the findings that uh, Charles has and the recommendations that he's going to make. But having said that, we've already made tremendous progress over the last couple of years in improving the quality and the, um, of the placement of our asphalt uh, throughout the community. Again, some uh, major right-of-way programs. Um, the re-envision program in transit, Debbie spent a fair bit of time talking about that last year, or uh, last week, excuse me. And uh, we're excited about uh, the, the outcomes of that. One of the things that is, uh, I don't mind admitting, is the bane of my existence is the, uh, the bin walls on the Claremont Access and the Jolly Cut. Uh, my first year as the general manager, we, uh, we had some pretty significant failures along there. Since then, Gord's team and asset management has been looking at um, how do we stabilize them over the short term and what do we do with them over the longer term. So council is gonna see some information coming to them over the next many months about what our plan is for the bin walls. Uh, to see, uh, to see what the plan is going forward on that. And again, the blue box program, again, is gonna take a fair bit of work uh, over the next uh, many months. Just some renderings of some of the exciting projects that will be uh, hopefully getting kicked off this year uh, with respect to uh, the maintenance and storage facility and the River, Riverdale Community Hub, the electric bus strategy, uh, uh, continued improvements in the uh, stadium precinct, precinct, excuse me. And then from a water wastewater perspective, uh, completing the major upgrades at Woodward over the next 12 to 18 months is gonna be a huge accomplishment for Andrew and his team, uh, but that will only lead into the kicking off of some pretty significant investments that we're gonna have to make in the Dundas wastewater treatment plant as well. Asset, asset management plans for core infrastructure will be before council uh, in around June or July of this year. Uh, continued work along the uh, waterfront trail and then uh, the ongoing work uh, down at the uh, Pier 8. I did allude to the fact that Tom Chessman will be bringing forward an update to our corporate energy policy. And if I can focus you in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we, as part of that, we will be revising our GHG reduction target from 80% by 2050 to 100% by 2050. And so we're hoping we can get council support for that. And uh, it's an ambitious target, but uh, I think these times call for ambitious, uh, ambitious actions. So that's essentially the story of Public Works. Uh, and now we'll get to the numbers. Uh, so this year, 
Uh, this uh, behemoth of a budget has come to you in four different occasions, but all in represents a $1.32 billion budget, both operating and capital. The piece that we're focused on today is obviously the, uh, the tax operating. One of the things that uh, I always uh, try to share with council is the fact that uh, we do receive a fair bit of revenue as part of the $388 million levy budget. And um, the different revenue sources that contribute to that budget, primarily the biggest one is transit fees or transit fares. And so as, uh, as you can imagine, uh, we, we, we submit this budget with, uh, with a bit of apprehension because we don't know what ridership is actually gonna do throughout 2021, so that's a risk. But just by way of some other examples of where some of the revenues come from other than the general levy, we receive about $4.4 million in permit fees. Uh, pavement cuts is a good example of that. We get about $4 million in red light camera revenue. We generate about $4 million in transit station revenue. Uh, the recycling program brings in another $2 million. Tim Hortons Field, about another $2.4 million in cemetery fees and around two, two and a half million dollars is what we're, we're anticipating for 2021. In addition to that, we do receive grants and subsidies in the order of $10 million, almost $11 million for the provincial gas tax, as well as the federal gas tax as well. And uh, we, uh, we anticipate um, the resource, recovery, resource Productivity and Recovery Authority, that's a mouthful, will uh, generate about $4.9 million in revenues related to our waste program. So just to give you a snapshot of some of the revenues that fund uh, this portion of our, our uh, the Public Works budget. I'll focus you now on our, um, our org, org chart. Um, Hamilton Water did present their budget and was approved prior to Christmas. So that's excluded from this, uh, this presentation as it does not hit the levy. You will see a reduction of just under six FTEs uh, for the 2021 budget. They all relate to transit. I believe Debbie alluded to this yesterday um, as part of the 2020 budget in order to find um, cuts to our budget, we did identify underperforming routes. And this is the annualization of the, uh, the reduction to those uh, underperforming routes. So we will uh, enjoy a reduction of six, six FTEs as a result of that. So this is just a summary of um, the divisions by division to give you a sense of where the, the pressures are. Uh, as you would imagine, the environmental services group uh, the lion's share of that pressure is related to the waste portfolio. Um, transit, the, uh, uh, the lion's share of um, their pressures were described to you uh, by Debbie last week. We did uh, get late breaking news that we're gonna see an increase in our funding allocation around the blue box uh, program. So that's gonna help bring the overall public works budget increase to 3.1. I'm gonna go through a couple slides now that are gonna talk about different numbers but just for absolute clarity, the overall public works budget increase is 3.1%. So I just wanted to, uh, to kind of repeat that because I am, uh, not that I'm trying to confuse you with numbers here, but I did want to walk through some of the other numbers. So this is just uh, a summary of uh, the pressures that you've uh, heard a little bit about through Debbie's presentation, as well as some of the stuff that you've heard throughout this presentation as it relates to the waste management portfolio, and then some uh, corresponding um, Reductions in our uh, our overall budget. Right sizing has achieved about a $400,000 benefit to the budget this year. Uh, every year our, our directors go through their budgets to see if our historical spend is somewhere where we can try to cut our budgets. And then on the second to bottom line there, a discussion with uh, our fleet folks and, uh, and uh, Mike and I had this conversation that we we think it's a relatively safe bet to lower our fuel costs, uh, and that's gonna drive an $890,000 reduction with respect to our, uh, our fuel costs. We recognize that, that is a, uh, that's a base budget thing. And as well, it's a little bit risky because the commodities market is always a risk, but uh, we're confident with that reduction. $4.5 uh, million dollar increase, a 1.8% increase as it relates to our employee related costs. And then uh, a lingering, um, $183,000 reduction, and I apologize, I'm working from the bottom up here, uh, but we're also gonna see uh, a corresponding reduction as a result to the complete transfer to Presto and the retirement of all of our paper fare media. So I, I, uh, I think it's important to show this slide. Uh, Ashley created the slide for me, and again, I'm not trying to bedazzle you with numbers here, but if we were to take out 
all of the things that we, I would say, I want to characterize it that we don't have control over. So uh, the new pricing that we've seen through the waste contract, the increases that we're making to transit service, some of those provincial costs that we have no control over. If you control for all of those things, and then you look at what I would call a pure maintenance budget across public works over the last four cycles, you will see pretty stingy budget increases. And I only point that out because I think it's a tribute to the excellent work that the directors and public works have done. Certainly since I became the general manager, they have not asked for any of the four divisions have not asked for additional staff and they've done a tremendous job at finding efficiencies and cutting their budgets to try to meet the targets that council has given us on an annual basis. Going forward, again, a uh, common theme that uh, with the 10-year local transit strategy that will continue to put pressure on our budgets as that as an increase uh, to service levels and as well the uh, the waste contracts. Uh, so um, I think it's a little more of the same that you're gonna see in the next couple of years when it comes to the, the big ticket items when it comes to the public works budget. So what follows after these slides are the divisional slides. I wasn't gonna walk through them. I'm sensitive to the fact that this has been a very long presentation. Um, it is one my, my, my one chance every year to, to share the good news with council and the community about the great work that's being done within public works. Um, and so at this point, I'm gonna hand it over back to you, Mr. Chair, and the entire team is ready to answer any questions that you might have. And just bear with us for a second, folks. The chair is just fixing his computer and he will be right there. What an unfortunate time for a nature break. My apologies. Councillor Ferguson, you're the first one up. Are you there, Councillor? Oh, well, it was a nature break. It wasn't fixing my computer, but thank you for being discreet. <laughs> Councillor Ferguson, I still can't hear you. I'm sorry. No, nope, there you're off again. Now you're on. I don't know. Do you hear me okay now? I hear you now. Perfect. perfect, whatever you did, don't, perfect. Touch, don't touch anything else. There's too darn many <laughs> buttons to put here and you gotta do them all in a certain <laughs> sequence now. And uh, so I just wanna start Mr. Chairman by thanking Dan for presentation. That's probably one of the best public works presentations I've ever seen. Um, it leaves very few questions. And, um, but what I like, uh, Dan very uh, succinctly illustrated what we're paying for, what we're buying. And uh, it, uh, if it wasn't for, you know, the waste side, the transit side, you know, he would probably be down in our target range. So I, I, I didn't realize how big his portfolio was until he put the one slide up. I know when I was a kid growing up, I used to watch a show called The Million Dollar Man. Well, now Dan's a $1.3 billion man. I had, I had no idea that Public Works was spending $1.3 billion a year, which is way over half our, our total budget. And, and so I don't have many questions, but just a few. Uh, first of all, on slide 30, Dan, you're showing a 48% reduction in the amount of line markings that you do. Have we improved our processes there to found better paint? Because I know we used to put new roundabouts in and the paint would be gone in six months. And I don't see that happening now. Have we changed the way we do line markings to see that 48% reduction? Thank you, Mr. So McKinney. if I... Uh... Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. If I may uh, invite Edward Soldo into the conversation, I know that Edward's been paying close attention to the uh, the different types of paint that we use and the durable type of markings that we use. So uh, I'd like Edward to uh, to expand on that, if you could. Thank you. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Soldo. Good morning, uh, Chair. Um, to the Chair, to the Councillor, uh, Edward Soldo, Director of Transportation Operations and Maintenance. Um, that number is a number that's going to fluctuate on a on a on a year to year basis. So. While we had uh, a reduction uh, last year, it was primarily driven by two things. We are using more durables as we move forward. Um, on all new arterial roadway reconstructions or rehabs, uh, we are uh, implementing durables so we don't actually have to paint them uh, on a yearly basis. So that uh, does provide some of that reduction. 
Uh, there was a minor reduction last year just because of the fact that COVID, we weren't actually able to pay for about a month as well. So that will fluctuate, but as we move forward, our, our goal is to use more durable paint uh, that lasts longer and that we don't need to repaint on an annual basis. Thanks. I know a few Council. years ago, uh, Edward, you switched over from, a, I don't know if it was oil-based paint, but you went to a latex paint and it didn't work. And and so um, you're putting different additives in these things now to, to what makes it more durable, I guess, so the public knows that? Mrs. Soldo? Uh, thank you to the chair. Uh, the uh, the change in the type of paint uh, a number of years ago is actually driven by uh, environmental regulations. So we are still using that same paint we switched to. Uh, it's more a matter that uh, we're actually using um, durable uh, line markings, which are uh, plastics. They're not actually paint, so we don't actually need to repaint them on, on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, Councillor. Thank you. Oh, you're breaking up. Or is it me? In, for some reason, we've lost your audio, Councillor. No, his microphone's on, but it's not coming through. Is, is it coming through now? There we go. Now it is. Okay. I had my diary sitting on top of the keyboard. Sorry. And I think it pushed, <laughs> it, pushed, it pushed the wrong key because I wanted to just to point out something to um, yeah. <laughs> Craig Murdoch. That, buttons, right? <laughs> I know to Craig Murdoch that uh, I attended the Roman conference over the last four days. And uh, I had the privilege of being the lead from the board on questions to the Ministry of the Environment. And I'll, at a later meeting, another meeting, I'll talk about what he said about conservation authorities because I got to talk directly to him. But on the, uh, I asked him about the blue box program and when we can expect the regulations on that. I think that was the word he used. Yeah, the regulations. He told me to tell our staff we can expect those by mid-February. And I don't know whether that's helpful or not, but uh, it was uh, issues that were raised by some of the other delegates that uh, they weren't getting these regulations. So you should be able to get them by mid-February. And, and that was on the public record in the open session that everybody heard. So just to share that with you. And I think my last, oh, the value engineering, I'm glad you, you're you picking actual contractors to tell you how to how to build things rather than engineers. And Mike McNally, you couldn't pick a better guy. Or, or Chris McNally there, the, uh, CNM McNally Construction. I didn't realize they had retired, but I'm glad to hear you're actually talking to contractors who have to build it that can coach you on how, how you value engineering. Because that type of value engineering will save you, you a lot of money. Uh, once the con uh, contract starts, because they can design it to be constructible uh, rather than look good on a drawing. Not to disparage our, our engineers who design these things, but the guys that build them can give you a lot of value. And my last point is just all good stuff. Um, waste is the main driver on your budget with 6% increase. And I think we all expected that when we closed the tenders for the um, the curbside collection and, and other, you know, the operation of the municipal recycling facility. But we keep hearing uh, some members of council saying that we we passed up on millions of dollars of savings by not going to bi-weekly garbage collection. And I know that a lot of assumptions were made when the advocates for that uh, used those numbers because there weren't any factual numbers available, our actual experiences. And quite often when people try to make arguments uh, when they're trying to measure what savings is, they can cock their head in, in, in their favor when reading the tape measure. I believe Craig, to through you to Craig Murdoch, Craig, since that debate and that decision to stay with weekly garbage collection, I understand Niagara um, actually tendered to go from weekly to bi-weekly. Do you have the numbers, Craig, on what the savings, if there was any, that Niagara experienced when they switched from weekly to bi-weekly? Mr. Murdoch or Mr. McKinnon? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, Craig Murdoch, Director of Environmental Services. Uh, Councillor Ferguson, we don't have their actual numbers. Uh, they Niagara didn't share those with us, but they did give us the percentage. Um, going by memory, I believe that their, their costs increased by 36%. Uh, this was contained in a report that we brought to Council last year. Uh, we also found that two other municipalities in the past year went to bi-weekly collection. One of them had a savings just over 1%, and the other one had a savings of around 10%. And again, we don't have that translated into dollars, but it did demonstrate that there isn't always savings. 
considering that we go to bi-weekly, it doesn't mean that your budget is cut in half because we would still continue to collect all recyclables on a weekly basis. It would only be garbage that would go to uh, bi-weekly and that is what other municipalities have done. Okay, and I appreciate that because it, it it's, Niagara is very similar and well, not as big as we are, but they're, they're one of the larger municipalities. And to make that switch was a, a bold move. But in reality, they actually saw a 33% increase, which may be in part to what we experienced where there's a lack of competition now in uh, garbage collection, which may have resulted in a good chunk of that increase. But I, I just wanted to set the record straight that we're not necessarily going to see the savings that were forecasted and keep getting quoted at meetings. Uh, based on the experience that Niagara found. So uh, that's all my question for now. It's just um, a great presentation, Dan. Thank you very much. Wow, right to five minutes. Good job, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Pearson, you're up next, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And, and I also wanna echo what Councillor Ferguson said, Dan, I, I started writing questions down um, and no sooner than I got them written, you were answering them. So the presentation was excellent. I'm going to keep this on a desktop because I think it has a lot of valuable information. Um, and I wanna thank you for certainly laying out the, um, the request I made earlier about sidewalk deficiencies. Um, I try very hard in inspecting or going and having a look at sidewalks when I have complaints of deficiencies and sending them off to staff recognizing just as you say spalding is not an issue um, cracks that aren't uh, a difference in levels and I'm, I'm pleased that you've now given the information of two centimeters is usually the um, you know the discon discontinuity between slabs etc so I really appreciate that input for the residents out there um, like I say all of my questions have been answered but I do want to ask about the the bell fiber optics, that's going throughout the whole city. Are you aware that, that that is going throughout the whole city? So from one end to the other? Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Yeah, to you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's that's my understanding, the exact geographic locations of that. I might have to rely on Gordon McGuire uh, okay. to describe that if, if, uh, if I could ask Gordon. Thank you for that. Mr. McGuire. Hi, um, through the chair, uh, Councillor Gordon McGuire, Director of Engineering Services. Uh, yes, Bell has a plan to overlay uh, the city and, and mostly within the urban boundaries together with um, some work in the rural uh, for a full overlay with the fiber optic network and uh, increased project. Super. So I, I'll follow up with you offline if I can, Gord, because I've had questions about uh, the Winona area and upgrades uh, with regards to um, broadband and fiber optics. So thank you for that. And I guess lastly, I, I just want to comment. Um, thrilled to see the tree planting. And I just received an email a few days ago that staff and forestry are trying to encourage and pursue increased tree planting to improve the tree canopy throughout the city of Hamilton. And I appreciate that um, process being implemented and um, direction. So it's good news. Lastly, I think is um, certainly the 50 point, the 50 road park at Dan, you mentioned that right at pretty well at the beginning of your presentations. Um, I only came into the issue with the 50 road parquet um, issue and that was because it was destroyed by not one, but two storms. It was destroyed by a storm, then it was reconstructed before I was elected in the area. And then it was destroyed again while I was campaigning. It was one of the first things top and center. It took quite a long time because that was about July, 2018 and it only got completed last year. Um, and I'm thrilled because it, it was a lot of work and if the general public, they could see, you know, on my constant emails back and forth, it was a lot of work for staff to engineer, to get all the approvals because it's more than just going in and putting up a, a, um, a barrier wall. So I, I commend staff on everything that they're doing and the points that you raised um, with regards to the processes and itemizing exactly what gets done. So uh, kudos to you and to all the team. Um, I certainly appreciate every time I send off an email and, and get uh, quick and efficient responses. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Danko, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, just uh, a couple questions. Uh, appreciate the uh, the value engineering with uh, talking to engineers and contractors because of course a <laughs> contractor can't pick up a shovel without an engineer showing them what to what they need to do. <laughs> uh, 
that said by an engineer, of course. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Just, uh, I'm glad to see the, uh, the emphasis in the presentation about the bin walls. That's been uh, kind of an ongoing um, concerns, particularly in Ward 8. And uh, I think it's been highlighted by the fact that we just finished the Jake Ketty Trail and uh, the paving on the Claremont access. Um, so I'm looking forward to what uh, what the plan is there for, for the escarpment bin walls. And then I'm just gonna briefly touch on the uh, on the uh, uh, the waste collection part of uh, of the budget drivers there. So, you know, as Councillor Ferguson mentioned, we don't know what the savings may or may not have been from biweekly collection because uh, council decided not to um, tender that as an option. So, um, in in the estimation, it was two point one million dollars a year uh, annual savings. But of course, uh, you know, we'll never know. And now we're we're stuck with that $2.9 million driver to, uh, to the budget, which is incidentally a 1.1% of the total uh, budget driver for 2021. So without that, you'd actually be under the 2% the target. Um, but my question is on the, the diversion rates. So um, through the presentation, our diversion rates kind of been um, stuck around that. I think it was 40%. And uh, I'm wondering how that impacts the cost to operate and maintain and the value that's left in the uh, in the landfill. Um, I remember part of the biweekly bi collection debate was that by increasing diversion through uh, through biweekly, we would be saving millions and millions of dollars in landfill space. So um, understanding that we're going to extended producer responsibility and and that the diversion is kind of up in the air right now, how that's gonna look. Um, where are we in terms of landfill space and planning for, for future, um, you know, the, the future of the landfill? Thank you, Councillor. Mr. McKinnon, please. Yep, to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll, I'll ask Craig if he can uh, back me up on this. I guess the first things that I would say is some of the things that we're gonna try to do in the short term to, to uh, make improvements in that area, and I, I may have alluded to it as the outreach. So, Angela Story and her gang are going to be uh, amping up the outreach uh, to the different sectors of the community to try to encourage um, more diversion. And you know, hand in hand with that, does go enforcement. So, making sure that we're we're doing a good job with respect to enforcement when it comes to what's going in the blue bins or or other uh, other bins. But as it relates to the, the life expectancy of the landfill, I think I'll rely on Craig for that, if I may. Thank you, Mr. Murdoch, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe the last time we reported, we were in the, the neighborhood of about 40 years left in the landfill. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, and, and just through the work with uh, the Waste Advisory uh, Committee, there's a lot of outreach now that, and we've kind of focused on the uh, the multi residential sector and also uh, commercial uh, diversion rates. But it's it, you know it, it's always frustrating that now we're waiting for extended producer responsibility, and uh, in the meantime, we're still absorbing that uh, the cost of the blue box program, which has a direct impact on diversion and, and the lifespan of the landfill. Anyway, really enjoyed the presentation today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor. The next Councillor is Councillor Tom Jackson, please. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Clark. Um, General Manager McKinnon, um, one of your best presentations. Very well done. And 115-page um, um, slideshow here that uh, was very detailed. And um, I really appreciated two things, how you went out of your way to, um, to recognize your team starting with the directors and right on down to the front line. I always love pictures of staff in the presentations. And as well, you're the third department in a row this week, whether it's by design or luck or through director communications, Matthew Grant. However, I am very glad you went out of your way to begin your presentation, Dan, by describing how busy Public Works has been the last 10 months during the time of the pandemic. Um, I'm very grateful, as I was with the two pr uh, previous presentations, and I hope the other departments go out of their way to say that as well, because there's a segment of my constituency 
that is keeping an eye and an ear close to the ground about how busy local government was or wasn't during the pandemic. Mr. Deputy Mayor, through you. So Dan, very good presentation to start off. Thank you. Um, Dan, just quickly on, I'll just go through chronologically here on your uh, slides. Um, slide 40, Dan, uh, community engagement and participation highlights, Deputy Mayor. Can I just ask, Dan, you've got under a bullet point, engage Hamilton Public Work Projects, Albion Falls. Could you also add, unless I missed it, in the other 114 pages, could you also add the Mountain Drive Park uh, Redevelopment Task Force, please? Um, it's, it's fairly new. Councillor Pauls and I just had a community meeting. Over 40 citizens uh, are engaged on behalf of thousands of residents near that park along uh, Concession Street. So if you would just please, for your records, Dan, add Mountain Drive Park, your staff are leading. Uh, the redevelopment plans, I would be grateful. Just a confirmation, Deputy Mayor, through you, please. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon, please. Yeah, to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, absolutely happy to do that. Thank you. Um, Dan, slide 62. I think it's important if you could just once again restate overall condition index. You've got here four roads that are showing different states of minor rehab needed, major rehab, do a full reconstruction, or the road is just fine for many years to come. You highlighted Mohawk Road, Upper Sherman, Greenford Drive, Marion Avenue. Just, a, a Dan, again, for public consumption, just quickly go through the stages of where taxpayer money is needed and to what degree. Through you, Deputy Mayor Clark, please. Thank you, Ms. McKenna. Yeah, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. The, the, yeah, the purpose of that slide is to really give some visual effect to the idea of assigning a score or to a particular road, and then the overall condition index of the of the overall transportation network, the overall road network. And so, uh, what this does is, is is help people kind of have a, a good example of what a score looks like. I guess the key message that I was trying to uh, convey with this is that. When you have an overall condi condition index of 63, that means you're going to have you're still going to have a lot of roads that are down in the 20s and 30s, and so you know it's 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 no different than any kind of uh, game of averages. Uh, the higher your average, the higher the Mr. lower McKinney. end of your average. So, councillors, can you make sure that your microphones are muted if you're not speaking, please? Oh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Clark. Thank you for that a respectful courtesy. No problem, Mr. McKinnon. Please proceed. Yeah, so, so that, that was essentially the key message there is to just help guide um, guide council as to, to what goes into the establishment of that overall condition index and what it means in the real world. Okay, thank you, Dan, for that explanation. Uh, Deputy Mayor Clark, uh, slide 72, Dan. Trends and issues for the next four years. Uh, legislation regarding um, contaminated soils waste. Now you've referenced the number of provincial ordinances and pieces of legislation. And I was very grateful, Dan, that you and Hamilton Water Services, along with council's unanimous support, agreed to spend the extra uh, millions of dollars to remove what was discovered as contaminated soil around the Kenilworth Reservoir to ensure the pristine water supply for the mountain. As you said, Dan, we're gonna discover probably in an old industrial city like Hamilton, more of these sites. My question, is there any opportunities through the provincial government, through your network, where council can support you in applying for provincial funds, given the fact that provincial ordinances are driving these uh, future removals, given the environmental times we're living in? Through you, Deputy Mayor Clark, please. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. McKinnon, please. To you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I I'm not aware of any funding programs to support the removal of contaminated soil. Uh, if I was a betting man, I would bet that that's never going to happen. Uh, I think this is a big problem in a lot of communities. Uh, the, the movement of soil uh, for decades has really been fairly unregulated. And uh, so I, I, while I, I think this is a good direction for them to go, um, you know, I'll characterize it as the sins of our fathers. There's lots of them out there. And so I don't think the province or the feds would ever want to uh, create a funding program for this because it's, uh, it's, I think it's pretty ubiquitous across the, the landscape. So. I appreciate the sincerity of your response to your uh, blunt response, Dan, and never ask you to speak for uh, the provincial government. And it's very unfortunate uh, with these additional regulations. The regulations are good, given the environmental times we're in, but unfortunate that uh, senior levels of government um, funding won't flow 
So on that point, Dan, I would leave it to you and Director Grice to ensure maybe future reserves as much as possible are being built up if we need them down the road for these type of locations that may come to our attention. Through you, Deputy Mayor Clark, please, for that confirmation or what Dan may be able to do. Thank you, Ms. McKinnon. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I could certainly take that conversation offline with Mike Zagarek. Uh, you know, building reserves obviously would put pressure on the overall budget, but uh, we can certainly uh, figure out whether or not there's a strategy to make sure we got money for a rainy day. Thank you, General Manager. Um, slide 81, Dan. Um, General Manager McKinnon, the second bullet point, Rymel Road, the environmental assessment, very, again, appreciative on behalf of Councillor Pauls and Councillor Danko to my colleagues last year for approving the $300,000 to do the EA. And General Manager McKinnon, I'm saying this a little with a little bit of cheekiness, but sincerity. You know what uh, some of the blowback we got a few years ago when we upgraded Rymel Road in my area of Ward 6 and 7 to the three new lanes with the middle turning lane, but some way, somehow between transit, uh, engineering, roads, the overall public works, there was a bit of a mishmash. And instead of buses being pulled off on, they had traditionally done on the side of the shoulder to pick up passengers. They suddenly were stopping in the middle of the east-west single lane and a lot of blowback I got, I shared it with you. All I'm looking for today, moving forward, as we're gonna eventually hopefully upgrade Rymel to five lanes from Dartnold to Upper James, that that will be definitely taken into account and hopefully avoided in the future. Through you, Deputy Mayor Clark, please. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's a 100% guarantee, uh, which I rarely give out. Uh, that, that was an unfortunate situation and uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, process and and, and um, organizational things that I'm looking at to make sure something like that doesn't happen again. Thank you, thank General you. Manager yeah. McKinnon. Thank you so much for that, for the record. Thank you. A couple of quick ones, last couple of ones, uh, Deputy sorry, Mayor. Sorry, Councilor, your five minutes has expired. I can put you on for a second time. Please put me on for a second time. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, next speaker is Councilor Pauls. Turn your mic on, there you go. Thank you, and thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to General Manager Dan McKinnon. Um, there are many to mention uh, in the public works to say thank you, how they help my office with almost 50,000 people that are in my ward uh, with all the questions and, and with help. And if you give me just 30 seconds, I wanna mention the department that have helped me the most and the thank yous that I've had from constituents saying thank you. One department was the traffic roads. David Ferguson, Mike Field and Ryan Krantz, thank you very much. People are saying what a great job you're doing and thank you. The waste um, division, Robin Pease, when, when Blue box weren't picked up or something wasn't picked up. He went there and picked it up for us and, and explained why sometimes the blue box weren't picked up. So thank you, Robin Pease. And forestry, I wanna thank Sam Scarlett and Lauren MacArthur. I had few problems with trees and uh, they were right there helping. So I wanna say thank you to them. And last of all, but not least is, um, the parks, Kara Bunn and Robert Wagner. As you know, in my ward alone, I have about four parks that I'm uh, uh, fixing or improving. And uh, like uh, Councillor Tom Jackson said, the mountain park was such a success. So thank you to those uh, uh, workers that helped me, make me look good, but really they do all the work. So thank you. My three questions are these. First of all, the Keddie Trail. As you know, it's a great place. I've done it many times up and down and the connectivity is amazing from Ward 7 to Ward 8 and so on. But I wanna ask you, is the, um, the trail being maintained in the winter? And I don't know who will answer that. Is uh, Director Murdoch or? Uh, Mr. McKinnon, if you wanna start, you can direct it to one of your staff. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. That's that's an excellent question. I'll, I'll defer to Edward Soldo, but that, uh, having a, a, a cycle track on an incline like that certainly presents some challenges for winter operations, but I'll let Edward answer that question. Thank you, Mr. Soldo, please. Uh, thank you, through the uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to the uh, Councillor. 
Uh, it is the intent uh, to maintain the Keddy Trail throughout the winter. Uh, it is a um, challenging facility for us to maintain given the, the grades and uh, some of the other issues that we have being it uh, that it's in the um, sort of the, uh, the shade of the escarpment itself. So depending on the day, we have some challenges there with the ice forming. So it is our intent to maintain it. Uh, yesterday, we had the snowfall. Um, we uh, did send out our resources and we had to go out there on uh, numerous times to actually deal with it. Uh, what we are saying to the public is when we are maintaining it, uh, what I mean by that is when we're physically on site with our equipment, we are actually closing it down because it's unsafe for our workers uh, to be maintaining it and potentially having someone coming down the escarpment itself. So we will put out notice uh, through our communications department uh, when we're actually closing it to maintain it, but it is our intent to deal with it uh, from a ice buildup perspective and as well as from a snow accumulation of, uh, perspective. Thank you, sir. Councillor. Thank you, and thank you, Director Ed Edward uh, Soldo. Do you know, I know when it opened, you were the first one to climb it up. So I called you that day because my husband and I actually walked it up. And the main concern was in the winter, how we would maintain that. But my next question towards that is, do we have signs posted? Because as you know, Edward, coming down, you could go up to 50, 60 kilometers per hour, and uh, it does cause uh, some... Uh, problem. So do we have signs posted everywhere at the, uh, of the caution? Uh, thank you to the Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor. We, we do have signage on the uh, trail itself that uh, asks people to slow down. Uh, we have signage related to how we want them to interact uh, with uh, other users on the trail itself. And we actually have speed limit signs on there of uh, 15 kilometers an hour, I believe. So it is something that um, as it gets more utilized, people will recognize some of the issues there and, and hopefully not speed. We have seen some occurrences where uh, cyclists have gone down at excessive speeds and uh, we'll be uh, actually having a uh, educational campaign related to that as well as we're uh, um, moving into the uh, summer season this year. Thank you, and I did, thank you. And I did not know they had a speed sign that you, at 15 kilometers per hour coming down, did you say? Uh, yes, so that, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that is correct. Uh, our our uh, assigned speed limit there is 15 kilometers an hour. Thank you for that. And I don't know if staff knows, but uh, Director Edward has done many Ironman, and he goes pretty fast uh, down hills and up hills. So uh, awesome. And uh, uh, I didn't know if anybody knew that. But anyways, uh, the next question uh, I want to say, ask is the Vision Zero, the speed reduction. I had, it says it's 54 neighborhoods. I've had neighborhoods call me and say, when's mine coming along? What is your allotted time to finish the speed uh, reductions? Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, through the uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor to the Councillor. Uh, it is a multi-year program. Uh, we have a number that we're intending to uh, complete this year. And I believe that we're going to be finalizing the program uh, going into 2022. Uh, there is a uh, website that we have on, on the, the city website that you can see which ones we have completed and which ones we are anticipating to complete as we move forward this year. So that information is readily available to the public and, uh, and I can uh, get you that information if required. That Councilor. would be great. That would be great because people are asking when it's their turn to have it because, uh, of course, speeding is the number one. And I'm sure all the councillors here uh, realize that speeding is a problem in our streets. And those are the main uh, inquiries we receive. But the last one is this. And I just had a call last night from a frustrated resident. And I was able to calm down because I was telling him it's the first snowfall that so we really had. He lives sort in a court, but the end of the court. It's recycling is always missed, but I look after it and Robin Peace always helps me out with that. The second was when we do the snow uh, removal, it packs, all the snow has been packed at the end of his driveway and he shovels it. Two hours later, he gets another big pile. Can you, uh, how can we improve the snow removal for those residents that live in courts? Is there anything we can do? Um, Mr. McKinnon. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll take that question, Mr. Deputy okay. Mayor. Uh, in, in terms of snow removal, uh, it, there is, and courts are 
uh, they are locations that are uh, somewhat problematic. Uh, usually in a court, you'll have driveways that are fairly closely spaced together and uh, that snow has to go somewhere. So we're trying to put it onto the boulevard sometimes is problematic and uh, you know there's very limited space. So what we do uh, have these discussions with our operators to ensure that you know they're trying not to block in people's driveways, but uh, in some instances there you know we, we can't not actually put uh, snow going across their uh, drive because there's no other place to put it. What we tend to do is in those problematic locations, we may uh, uh, come in after the fact and, and do some additional cleanup to remove it uh, so that it's not sitting in the in the court itself or bundled up in one area. So we try not to move it just into one area. If you have a yeah, specific we'll... location, Councillor, uh, yes, we, we can definitely talk about that offline. Oh, that would be great. Um, and I wanna say really, what a great job public work does because most of my constituent, like I said, almost 50,000 that I look after in Ward 7, most of them say what a great job you have done. So I really want to thank you for really making me look good when I called them and say, what's the work done? And they said yes, and they thank me, but I want to relate it to you and I want to thank you. So thank you, staff. And thank you, General Manager Dan. You're welcome. Well done, Councillor. That's right within your five minutes, right up to the mark. Uh, speakers are Councillor Johnson, Vanderbeek, and Jackson. Councillor Johnson, you're up next. Yep, thank you. And most of my um, questions have been asked, but I um, and I had to step out for another meeting, so I'm I'm hoping this one, I'm not repeating myself. So Dan, again, what everyone else has been saying about your staff, kudos, um, especially under these trying times, they've always, they've always been wonderful and, and it's just made it all the more obvious in the past eight months. Um, so Dan, can you please go to, or, or I'm gonna refer to slide number 50, 43. This is the Dickinson Road sanitary design that you've put up. And this is a, a tunneling project that's being branched off from the Highway 56 Centennial Parkway tunneling project. I'm just giving some context here, Deputy Mayor. Um, the entire area, including the new uh, Dickinson Road tunneling is not serviced by city water at all. The residents rely mainly on their wells. So many residents during the 56 Centennial Parkway tunneling, as you know, many of the residents had disruption in their wells, farmers lost water supplies for their livestock, staff were scrambling to get um, tanks, portable tanks delivered uh, for some areas and some properties got four and five tanks because of the, the demand on water they needed for their, their livestock, et cetera. Can you remind me of the original timeline for the Centennial Tunneling Project? How long was it supposed to take? Mr. McKinnon. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, I'm gonna ask Gord to uh, help me out with this. I, we did experience some delays on the uh, Centennial trunk. Uh, there was, uh, to my comments during my presentation, tunneling is always a challenge. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why we wanted to do the value engineering this time to take a second, very closer look at all of the issues that we might find, which re which resulted in us doing a, a, an additional significant amount of geotechnical um, investigation. And it's not unusual for tunneling projects to have an adverse effect on local um, aquifers. So. Uh, but having said that, I'll, uh, I'm going to see if Gord can uh, can answer your question. Thank you, Gord. So uh, through the chair, you councillor, um, I believe that project had um, an additional schedule uh, adjustment of around a year, and that was in some case due to an equipment breakdown, and there was also uh, a health and safety issue in one of the uh, in one of the tunnels as well. And thank you for your answer, Gord. And just for the public record, um, when the Centennial pa uh, Parkway tunneling was coming up 56, there was uh, an, all kinds of tests done. And uh, it, was, it was almost like a known fact. We know where the water's coming from. We know what direction it's flowing. Um, and as it turned out at the end of the day, it was the farmers that stepped forward after the tunneling was halfway through to say, you've got it not correct completely correct. This is where the waters are, are, are flowing. This is where the aquifers are. Have we sat down with the farmers in the area, please, to, and I'm saying please, to confirm the findings of, of your testing. So going forward, we don't hit the snags. These are some of the lessons that I learned through this tunneling project. 
Thank you. Where? Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor, that's a that's an excellent suggestion. Um, what we're going to do right now is we're taking back the information from the value engineering, in particular the insights from the uh, the contractors and the engineers uh, on both sides of this this project. Um, we're definitely getting ready for some outreach, and we'll connect through you through your office to make sure that we're getting all the uh, all the correct inputs uh, as we move forward on this. And, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I have the utmost respect for engineers, so this is not a slight against engineers and the work that they do. But there is also experts out there that are experts at living there, experts that have been there for generations upon generations, and they know the lay of the land probably better than anybody who's ever gone to university. So I really would appreciate that extra um, effort this time because I think this would help all of us at the end of the day um, correct some problems that may be happening um, and I and I am going to go offline with the odor issues again in Bembrook Village we're still getting complaints coming through um, it's it's I don't know actually I, I would like to do this on the public record through you Deputy Mayor to Dan McKinnon um, general manager you know we've been dealing with uh, odor issues throughout the Bembrook Village we are uh, getting responses back from the staff saying that well when we got there they weren't there anymore but we know that there is a problem so with all due respect, why do we need to keep calling the staff for them to come out and say, no, it's not there anymore because it dissipated before we got there? Is there a way that we can put out a message to the community of Bimbrook Village that we understand that there's a notar issue and these are the steps we are taking to eliminate it? Mr. McKinnon. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we absolutely can do that. Um, I will confess odor um, problems are they are like ghosts sometimes, and I know it's frustrating for the residents because they are there all the time, so it's it's very evident to them. But uh, we can absolutely do some kind of communication and we can work with your office if you'd like. That would be great. And through you, Deputy Mayor, do we know what the problem is? Mr. McKinnon. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna rely on Andrew. Um, I know both Gord and Andrew's shop were both working on that uh, that issue. I know there's been a number of tactics that they've employed to try to uh, to deal with it. Um, maybe if uh, Andrew wants to jump in, I don't know if Andrew, if you've got a, a more recent update. Mr. Uh, sure, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Andrew Grace, uh, Director of Hamilton Water. Uh, so Councillor Johnson, we are working on the issue right now in terms of pinpointing exactly where it's coming from. We do not have a firm answer yet, but what we do know is it's making its way to our pumping station. So right now we're working on installing a chemical inhibitor to help control those odor issues. And that is the information that we plan on bringing forward to Public Works Committee in the near future, but certainly willing to work with you on how we wanna message that to your community. But that will hopefully control the odor issues for everybody as we continue to determine where it is specifically coming from. And thank you for that. One last question, Deputy Mayor, uh, through to Andrew. When this report comes to Public Works, I'd really appreciate a heads up on that because if anything that's involving my my ward, I and I do read over the 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 the, the agendas faithfully, but there is the odd day where I, I get caught up in doing other things and I don't have time to do it. So especially when they're from com uh, committees that I'm not on. So if you don't mind, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for your time, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Well within your time. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Vanderbeek, please. Thank you, sir. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity. So through you to uh, General Manager McKinnon, um, first of all, an excellent, excellent presentation. And I have to tell you that, um, that just as another one of my colleagues mentioned, Councillor Pearson, uh, as I had questions, often they were answered as you went through the presentation, as they often are by people who are giving presentations. But in this case, the presentation was, um, I think the caliber of presentations in this year's budget process have been just superb. And this was no disappointment. So um, I do, I do would like, I would like you to go back to um, what you, what you were saying in slide 97, where you talked about the, um, the increase this year of 3.1%. And then you talked about the things that we have no control over and and what that would do to uh, to your ask for public works um, if we were not having to deal with those things. And if you could just uh, reiterate some of what you said about the fact that I believe um, if, if 
I heard you right, that in fact, um, your budget would have come in at 1% rather than even the 2% that we asked you to keep your budget at. That's a full percent less than, than we requested. I just wanna make sure I heard that correctly. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Yeah, thank you to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I guess the point I was making is that when we put out a, a waste contract to the market, we have no control over the price that we're gonna get. So those increases are outside of our control. Additionally, in the transit uh, portfolio, there are a number of things. Uh, we, we can't control darts, darts ridership. We can't, uh, we had very little influence over the whole Presto agreement. Um, and, and then the council approved 10 year local transit strategy is increasing the service levels that we, we have in transit. So those are things that I would, you know, my argument is that they can't be accommodated for in a quote unquote maintenance budget. And um, because there's, there, it's an addition to the service and there, and there are costs that we just have zero control over. So, you know, the exercise was if I take those out um, and then you look at what the, what the team has done over the last three or four years, our budget increases over the last three or four years have been very, very stingy because of all the effort that has gone into looking at the history of the different budget lines, looking at continuous improvement, trying to find ways to do the same thing or more things with the same staff. So uh, it really was, uh, I, I guess, a nod from me to the directors and a public acknowledgement of the great work that they're doing to try to contain costs. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, sir. Um, and and that is the end of my questions. But if you'd give me just a little latitude, I'd like to mention that that uh, your team of directors uh, are incredible. They are incredible. And whenever I have needed something, they have they go the extra mile. And um, I just want to recognize them because uh, it's been an especially difficult year, in particular. Um, and, you know, even though they're always very accommodating, nothing seemed to be too much work, nor did it seem like they were placating me <laughs> in any way uh, with, to, to respond to the things that I needed in my ward. And so I really think that, 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 that we need to recognize the, the, uh, the extra effort they've had to put in this year. And... Uh, show our appreciation, or at least I want to show my appreciation for the way they deal with my office and my ward and the city generally. So if you would just pass those accolades along, I'd be grateful. And that's the end of my questions. Thanks. Thank you. That's the end of the first time speakers. So I'm going to add myself to the list, Councillor Vanderbeek, if you could bring your mic back on. And there. Absolutely. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. And I want to echo my colleagues, uh, an excellent comprehensive report and uh, very proactive because it really did was it was answering questions before we even asked them so well done mr mckinnon and your entire team because i know you didn't do it on your own um a couple of questions uh with with regards to sidewalks did i hear correctly that the sidewalks are inspected annually mr mckinnon uh, through you, Mr. or through you, Madam Chair, um, I, I, I would want Edward, Edward to confirm. I, I believe it has, to, in order to satisfy MMS, it's an annual inspection, but Edward can confirm that. Uh, yes, that's correct. Underneath minimum maintenance standards, uh, you have to have an annual inspection of your sidewalks to identify any deficiency. Councillor? Interesting. Um, so, can I ask on page 77 of the report? Um, chair, it has at the top reported deficiencies citywide in 2019. Who reported them? Um, Director Soldo. Uh, thank you. Through the uh, chair to the councillor, those deficiencies uh, are the ones that we would have picked up in actually physically walking every kilometer of sidewalk that we have. There may be some other ones that we get. There's a lot of a lot of times we get. Um, uh, calls through the councillor's office or from residents uh, as well. So we add that into our database, but uh, we do walk every slab of concrete uh, every year to uh, pick up those deficiencies. Councillor? Okay, I'm just going to continue to hammer away on it, Mr. Soldo, because in my ward, um, I have also been walking and canvassing the neighbourhoods and I am surprised by the number of 
cracks or trip hazards, the amount of pavement or asphalt that was put down to fix a trip hazard years ago that's still there. Um, and so uh, I've got lots of issues and concerns in, in my ward with regard to the sidewalks, but I'll take that up offline. Um, uh, questions about the odor. Can I ask exactly what's been going on in the last two years? So in two years, I've been making complaints about the odors from the sewer trunk on Upper Centennial Parkway. I continue to make those complaints sometimes in a committee meeting or a council meeting. Um, and I'm still trying to understand exactly what we have done. Have we hired consultants? What work has been completed? Because I've not, candidly, Mr. McKinnon, I have not been provided any status updates. I hear nothing about it unless I complain about it. Through you, director uh, or general manager. <laughs> yeah, so I can, I, I'll, I'll maybe go to uh, Andrew for some help on this as well. But uh, the, um, that project theoretically should have been beneficial from an odor perspective because it was a long force main uh, that discharged um, kind of in, a, in an area where there wasn't a lot of residents. So it is a little uh, vexing what's going on there right now. Um, one of the, I know one of the working theories that Andrew and his team have is that uh, the odors were always there. It's just that where it discharged to the gravity sewer, um, it, 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 there was not a lot of residents around, so nobody noticed the odors. But having said that, Andrew's got greater control of the details here, so maybe I'll, I'll uh, let him respond. Uh, so through you, Madam Chair, uh, Dan is correct. We certainly are working through a number of theories right now, but that is certainly kind of top of the list is that uh, we have altered the location of the pumping station discharge uh, when the tunneling work was done by Gore McGuire's team. And we do feel that it is now discharging into an area that is heavily populated and odors are more uh, more prevalent now than they were in the past. In terms of what we have been doing, we certainly do have a consultant on board that is doing analysis to determine, uh, to try and determine where this odor is emanating from. Maybe it is a particular, maybe it's a particular type of business, and if that's the case, we can take a, you know a different course of action. Uh, but what we are doing right now in terms of remediation efforts is installing an odor control system at our Bimberg pumping station that will help remove the hydrogen hydrogen sulfide from the system, and hopefully that will reduce the odor issues as we work on a more long-term solution. And all this information will be included in this upcoming uh, report to Public Works Committee. Uh, and I think we're targeting early March to get that information in front of committee. Uh, that's about as quick as we can get to get to the group. Councillor. Thank you, Chair. So may I be candid? The smell is poop. That's the smell that the residents along Upper Centennial Parkway are having to deal with on a regular basis. And the complaints keep coming. As a matter of fact, the odor is so strong, people were thinking it was the landfill. But when you go up to those candy cane vents, that's where the smell's coming from. In two years now, we've been complaining about it. In two years, it has not been fixed. And I am incredibly frustrated by it because it's affecting the quality of life for residents who live there. And candidly, Mr. Grice, many of these residents have lived there for many, many years, much longer than, than this has not been an explosion of development. Um, these are folks who, who've lived in, in, um, in Upper Stony Creek a long time and they've been smelling it. So I, I really would appreciate um, a status and, 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 and informing the public what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, what's going to be fixing it, how are we going to fix it? It's two years is too long with the greatest of respect, Mr. McKinnon and Mr. Grice. Um, can I ask, uh, Mr. Soto, a quick question. I've got about a minute and a half left here. Um, we've installed these automated speed cameras. I think they call them. They're really the old fashioned photo radar. Um, and we put one as a pilot along Bellagio. Did we get the results of that? Because I think they, they had the cameras up there on Bellagio for a time. Director uh, Soldo. Uh, thank you through the chair to the uh, to the councillor. Uh, we're now in our um, uh, at the end of the, the fourth month, I believe, in terms of the AAC cameras, and they, we do rotate them as per the schedule that councils approved. Uh, on the Bellagio site, uh, it, it, the number of violations there are significantly lower. There is a lag in terms of the data that we get in terms of of 
the number of violations uh, uh, coming from the uh, processing center. So our goal is to um, have this data available on our websites for the public and providing council with updates on a more frequent basis, but uh, we're just dealing with the lag that we see right now. We went from about uh, 20,000 uh, tickets in the first two months to, I would say a couple of thousand with Bellagio. It is a, a lower volume roadway in a school site, so the number of violations were lower. Councilor? Yes. Well, that's that's good to hear, but 2,000 violations along that area where there's two schools is, is really disconcerting. So I'm glad that the pilot was there, and I'm glad that you're going to be sharing that information with constituents because I think they, the public um, needs to know um, the amount of the violations and what the trend is. And hopefully as we have these cameras out there, the trend is going to start to go down because people don't want to get the, the ticket and they're paying more close attention to the speeds that they're traveling at. So I think the program is great, Mr. Soldo. Uh, I truly appreciate it. Uh, just needing the information to share with the community who are truly concerned about the safety of their children uh, going to those two schools. Um, those are all my questions. Again, my thanks to Mr. McKinnon and his team. This was a phenomenal <laughs> report. I've never seen one this long, um, but it was really filled with, with excellent information uh, and that helped not only us, but the public. So I thank you very much for that. And with that, I will take the chair back. That's the end of my five minutes. And I will relinquish. Uh, thank you very much. Is the other speaker, Councillor Jackson, is a second time. Is Councillor Ferguson all? Okay, perfect. So Councillor Jackson, you requested a second time, by all means. You have the floor, sir. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Clark. Um, Dan, if you turn to lastly, page uh, 98, uh, about uh, darts and key transit uh, drivers. But before I get to that, um, Dan, just tell me how many, to what's your total complement of employees, including management, uh, General Manager McKinnon in Public Works? Through you, Deputy Mayor Clark, please. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the, the complement's around 2,300, if I do the math here, 2,347, I believe. Okay. And that would include your management team, directors, et cetera, Dan? That's everybody, and it includes Hamilton Water. Terrific. Okay, that's good to know. 2,300 of the approximate 7,500 full part-time casual that we have in our uh, corporation. Excellent. And I want to give, before I finish off with slide 98, uh, General Manager McKinnon, I think a few years back, I was um, a couple of years in a row in budgets um, after and advocating for uh, more attention to the catch basins. I can tell you sincerely, General Manager McKinnon, at least from the East Mountain community, I've hardly had any complaints of regular maintenance and cleanup of the catch basin. So a compliment to you and the team, and maybe just it was a matter of just putting additional resources to it, or maybe a different way of ensuring they weren't backing up on the roads. Through you, Deputy Mayor Clark, maybe for a comment from Dan. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. I, I know that uh, um, I believe it's Bob Paul and his team have been working hard to try to stay ahead of the catch basins. I know we're using contracted services as well now to help us have a have a proactive uh, management program to stay ahead of any road flooding issues. So uh, it's nice to know that the residents are seeing the outcome of those efforts. Perfect. Okay, slide 98, and this is the last one for me, Deputy Mayor Clark. No so I'm not, I'm not gonna be a broken record. Obviously, I think the rest of my colleagues are tired of hearing about darts and the lack of darts and its board appearing before council as a delegation which they could apply for, similar to library, RBG, Conservation Authorities, police boards. And I've been after it for several years in a row because of the increased budget pressure it's providing on our taxpayers. As overall wonderful this DART service is, and I was a supporter a couple of years ago of renewing the contract with DARTs as well. But all I hear, General Manager McKinnon, is uh, folks, uh, members of council, uh, a ridership uh, growth in darts is increasing every year. Extra pressures, extra amount of uh, people that are uh, eligible to ride darts, uh, putting extra pressure on the taxes and the funding. And all I'm going to say, General Manager McKinnon, looking for a comment back. If your ATS, which is the Accessible Transportation Services Management Team, if they are on top of it, working as liaison and overseeing the dispatching, et cetera, of the DART service and basically the budget driver 
continued upward pressure is beyond our control, but Councillor Jackson, relax. My team, uh, we've got it under control. Nothing to worry about, fair enough. But all I hear from time to time, uh, Deputy Mayor Clark, long preamble to my question, all I hear and all we sometimes get is we gotta go on camera because there's issues at darts publicly. Oh, the darts uh, counselor in light of new legislation, uh, 75,000 additional rides last year we weren't anticipating. So I'm not gonna request, cause I think I'm the only member of council that ever wants them to appear annually to hear from the board and to ask the general manager, uh, Mindorf, some questions. So through you to general manager McKinnon, if everything's under control, so be it. And I just want that reassurance. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Clark. Mr. McKinnon, please. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, that, that's, a, that's a, a broad question. Uh, the things that I can say with certainty is that, on, you know, pre-pandemic, DARTS was providing the service at a cost per trip that was very competitive. Uh, and I think we've been very clear about that. When we compare ourselves to other municipalities, uh, the cost per trip is, is, is very competitive. Uh, some of the challenges that we have relate to the agreement that we have with them that doesn't provide us the level of control that all, I would say all of our other contracts provide for us. And so there is, there is a, 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 I'll call it an opaqueness to their operation that uh, our, our, our contract doesn't allow us to penetrate. And, and so that sometimes causes us problems. So, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be fair to them, but at the same time, it's a very unique arrangement that we have with them here. And um, there's no question from a, from a contractual uh, performance management perspective, uh, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, I appreciate Counselor, you have one minute, 50 seconds for supplementary. Oh, I'll be able to wrap up real fast, Deputy Mayor Clark, thank you. Uh, General Manager McKinnon, uh, appreciate the delicacy of your response. I'll just now leave it to the initiative of the DARTS board if they want to request through clerks to appear as a delegation in the future. I found it invaluable in the past when they finally did appear, sometimes uh, yanking them along to get them to agree to appear. But at this point in time, so be it. I know the service is much needed amongst my seniors especially. And as issues come and go, I guess we'll just deal with them as they come before for committee reports in the future. Thanks so much, Deputy Mayor Clark, for your indulgence. No, nope, my pleasure. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Ferguson, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan, just one question that uh, struck me as the questions were going through. You happened to slip in during your presentation, right at the start, or the start you found out yesterday, there's gonna be a further uh, subsidy from the province as part of the phasing out of, of the blue bins by municipalities and moving it over to the generators. And uh, that you built that savings into the 3.2% that's before us today. How much was that savings you found out yesterday? So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just, just uh, uh, for the record, it, we didn't find out yesterday, but we did find out late in the budget process here and I'm gonna try to find it. Um, this, this presentation was actually finished about a week and a half ago. So it was in the last two or three weeks, it's been late in the budget process that we became aware of it. And um, I believe it was $1.3 million. Well, that's a lot of money. So um, question then to Mike Zagarek. Um, if we found this out later, is, is Mike on, on the meeting today? I believe so, Mr. Zagarek. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm anticipating Councillor Ferguson's question. So the <laughs> adjustment, <laughs> the adjustment of uh, $1.4 million was captured in my, uh, I believe it was late January, sorry, uh, January presentation. And it was an amendment that uh, Councillors Collins and the mayor moved, uh, put forward to bring us to the 2.5% exclusive of uh, or sorry, inclusive of Hamilton Police Services Board's budget request. So short answer is it is reflected in our current position, global budget Okay, position. And my, I had my hopes up there for a while, Mike, and might get us below 2% of that $1.3 million. That's a lot of money um, wasn't included. Um, 
So, so Dan, another question. Typically, you show us every year, and it's always been very volatile. The revenue we received from our blue box resaleables, like you know, aluminum and and um, paper and cardboard, and so on. What is in your budget this year for recoverables um, from the blue box program? Because we used to peak out over five million dollars. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure if I have that in front of me. I'm not sure if Craig has that at his fingertips, or maybe Ashley Bono. I assume it's deteriorated again. I, I and maybe if Craig knows that, that would be helpful. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm sorry I don't have that at my fingertips. But if Ashley's on the line, hopefully she has that. Ashley. If we don't, uh, Councillor, we can certainly get that to you right after the meeting, if you like. Councillor, does okay. that work for you? Yeah, I guess it's better to have it out publicly so everybody hears the number because we've been challenged on this, you know, with uh, the Chinese problem. They're not taking certain recyclables anymore. And I'm just curious to know what you're forecasting now for 2021. So, yeah, Dan, if you could send that out later, that would that would be great. And lastly, I, I didn't want to point out any directors or managers because I, I've always run the risk of missing someone, but I too very much appreciate the service they provide to our office. And, you know, you mentioned about Cynthia Graham and uh, as an example to the rest of her team, if she's going hard, they're going hard. And, and, and I think that applies to a lot of your managers. And, you know, Dave Albertson jumps out at me, but there's lots of others. I'm not going to run the risk of missing them much, but I, I do appreciate the level of service that our, our directors and and managers do provide to our offices to help us with our day-to-day -day things. And that's all I got, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for rounding that out. And I think everyone on council agrees they, they've done an exemplary job. We really appreciate everything that they've been doing. Seeing no further questions, uh, I need a mover and a seconder so that we can receive this presentation. It's moved by Mayor Eisenberger and seconded by Councillor Van Der Beek. And that will be an electronic vote that will be popping up momentarily. Please let me know if you are having issues with your computer. The vote is up. Councillor Collins. Councillor Partridge, yours go thumbs up from Councillor Partridge. And who was the other one, Madam Clerk? Uh, I don't see them. Mm -hmm. The vote is now closed, and it carried 14 nothing. We're now moving on in our agenda to item number nine, which is notices of motions. Neighbor to neighbor community food center funding. Item point one, Councillor Danko, are you prepared to put your notice of motion today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be leaving it as a notice of motion today. It'll be on tomorrow's uh, emergency and community services meeting uh, as, a, as, a, as a motion. Um, but just real quickly to introduce it to committee this okay. afternoon. So, sorry, Councillor, I'm confused. Yeah. So if it's being put out as a notice of motion at a budget GIC, I'm not sure how it can be on an ECS meeting as a as a motion. No, it's the budget ECS meeting tomorrow. Healthy and safe uh, communities. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I misunderstood what you said. My apologies, <laughs> sir. So would you mind reading your notice of motion into the public record? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so whereas the city council supported the establishment of the ongoing operation of the neighbor to neighbor community food center since 2015, whereas the neighbor to neighbor community food center has become a community hub providing programs and support to area residents, whereas the neighbor to neighbor community food center focuses programs and supports on hunger and food insecurity with connections to poverty, inequality, racism, health and the environment and social relationships, 
whereas the neighbor to neighbor community food center aligns with and contributes to the goals and objectives of the city of Hamilton's food strategy strategy. And whereas council has provided financial support to neighbor to neighbor for the community food center operation in the amount of $200,000 per year for the past five years expiring December 31st, 2020. Therefore, be it resolved that five additional years of funding for the neighbor to neighbor community food center be supported at a the cost of $200,000 per year to be provided on an annual basis for five years to be funded through the tax stabilization reserve and uh, that this motion um, be referred to the 2021 operating budget deliberation for consideration. Thank you very much, Councillor Danko, much appreciated. Are there any other notices of motion from councillors today? Seeing none. We are now moving on to the adjournment. May I have a mover and a seconder to adjourn the meeting. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Vanderbeek, and we need the vote. So please don't go away before you vote. It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> it's up. And they're off. Thank you. Councillor Park. Councillor Partridge, can you uh, see the vote or do you need a thumbs up from Councillor Partridge? I'm sorry, Councillor Pearson. Nope, Councilor thank Johnson, you. I cut someone off. Yeah, it was me, Account Mr. Deputy Mayor. I just wanted to thank you again and also make sure that Dan checks with um, Jason to see who won on that bet earlier today about finishing the book <laughs> or the, for his budget presentation. <laughs> I was listening. Thanks, Mr. I Chairman. I forgot about that. <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you tomorrow. <laughs> okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Excellent work. Thank you so much.